A Second Chance at Love, A Sage Creek Romance. Written by Lorena Hoops. Copyright 2022. Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2023. Chapter 1. William. Sage Creek, Texas, 1883. William Wild Bill Cook smoothed his black duster and stepped through the swinging batwing doors into the saloon. His eyes scanned the bustling, noisy room for the slim, bearded man whose face he had memorized from the wanted poster. But he didn't appear to be in the room. Of course, that meant nothing. Sometimes the men tried to disguise themselves or hide in low-lit corners. Occasionally, he even found them upstairs with one of the saloon girls, if they had the money. Once he had even found a mark pretending to be a saloon girl— not the brightest one, as he hadn't seemed to realize his full beard was a dead giveaway. It didn't matter. Wild Bill Cook always got his man. He sidled up to the bar, pulled his black hat low on his eyes, and ordered a whiskey. He wasn't a big drinker. His wife had hated the stuff. But he found one drink honed his senses and allowed him to survey the room without standing out too much. The last thing he needed was someone recognizing he didn't belong and warning Frank Monroe. The man was a cattle thief and deserved to be behind bars. But no man liked the prospect of jail time and most fought tooth and nail not to go. When the drink slid his way, William picked it up, trying to ignore the cloudy film on it. Catherine would roll over in her grave if she saw him drinking from such a cup and adjusted his position so that his back was to the bar. A heated poker game was taking place at a table across the room, but a closer look ruled out any of those men. Another few men sat at a table closer to his position, tossing back beers, but they were all too large to be his mark. His eyes continued to scan left, but after coming up empty, he finished his drink and turned back to the bartender. Monroe must be hiding out upstairs then. Who do you have working tonight? William asked the bartender. It's been a long ride and I'd like to unwind. The long-haired bartender smiled at him, revealing a bottom row of crooked teeth, one a slightly brownish color. What's your flavor? William shook his head as he spun the glass on the counter. I'm not particular. What are my choices? The bartender scanned the room. Looks like we have two blondes, Nellie and Lizzie, down here, which means Minnie, my brunette, is upstairs, engaged in other business. I guess I'll take a blonde then, William said. Nellie! The bartender hollered across the noisy room. He cocked his head in a come-here gesture, and a moment later a plump woman appeared at William's side. Her long hair was pinned to one side and curled, Bright red lipstick covered her lips along with a dark rouge. A blood-red dress trimmed in a black fringe hugged her frame a little too tightly, sending her extra flesh rolling over the top. William forced his eyes to remain on her face. You looking for a good time, honey? She asked, laying a hand on his arm. William resisted the urge to shake her hand off, though its mere touch sent repulsion coursing through his veins. She was his ticket upstairs, and he could swallow his revulsion a moment longer to apprehend his man. Sure am. Are you good at giving one? I'm good at everything, honey. Her voice flowed like silk out of her mouth, but it had no effect on William. He hadn't been with a woman since the death of his wife, and he wouldn't until he married again. If he married again. Lead the way, then, he said, pushing the glass back to the bartender and standing. Nellie headed for the back stairs, sashaying her ample hips as she walked. William kept his eyes peeled for Monroe as he followed her, just in case he had missed the man in his initial scan. It didn't happen often, but William stayed alive by always checking twice if the opportunity presented itself. With each step, the wooden stairs groaned under his weight, 
and William held tight to the railing as he climbed. The top of the stairs opened into a small hallway. Two doors were on the left and two were on the right, but all were closed. How was he going to determine which room Monroe was in? Do you girls all have a regular room? William asked, hoping her answer would let him know which room Monroe was in. Sort of, Nellie said with a shrug. But there are three other girls, so we have to share. Not helpful. He'd have to be more direct. Which one is Minnie's regular room? William narrowed his eyes as he listened, but he heard no sound coming from any of the rooms. Nellie's smile faded, and she crossed her arms, her flirtatious manner shifting to one of distrust. Are you here for Minnie or for me? William scanned her face. He didn't know her, didn't trust her, although in honesty, he trusted no one. But he had little choice but to ask for her help if he wanted any chance of surprising Monroe. Honestly, ma'am, I'm here for the man who is with Minnie. If you can point out her room, I'll pay you for your time. Nellie's eyes widened, and for a second, William was sure she was going to bolt and run to the bartender. But then her face shifted, as if realizing she could get paid without having to work, and she smiled. Sure, her room is the second one on the left. William tipped his hat and headed that direction. His right hand fell to the hilt of his revolver as his left turned the handle. Monroe and a brunette turned his direction as the door opened. Run, Frank! Nellie shouted from behind William. A look of surprise followed by a flash of fear crossed Monroe's face before he rolled out of the bed and dove for cover. With a grumble, William whipped his gun out. This was not the encounter he'd planned, and he hated when things didn't go according to plan. Frank Monroe, you're coming with me. You're wanted for stealing cattle. The brunette pulled the sheet around her and let out a blood-curdling scream that distracted William just enough that he didn't see Nellie run up behind him until it was too late. She rammed him with her shoulder, sending him into the door jam. A shot went off, followed by two more female screams. William thought at first that he had fired his gun when Nellie hit him, but then the searing pain just above his clavicle hit him. Monroe sat on the floor, his gun smoking in his hand. William tried to raise his arm to fire a shot, but it would no longer obey his command. As soon as Monroe realized he had the upper hand, he scrambled up. But before he could make it very far, the thunder of footsteps reached the second floor. What's going on here? The bartender demanded, splotches of red lighting up his face and emphasizing the scar that resided there. That's Frank Monroe, William said, gritting his teeth through the pain. He's a wanted man, and I'm bringing him in. This one ought to be under arrest for abetting a felon. He pointed at Nellie with his left hand, trying to ward off the darkness that was creeping in on his vision. You can't arrest my girl, the bartender roared. Actually, we can, a male voice said from behind the bartender. Before the darkness won the battle, William noticed a star pinned to the man's chest. At least his man wouldn't get away. Emma Emma was just finishing wrapping the bandages when the door of the clinic swung open. Deputy Jennings and Sheriff Johnson stepped in, supporting a dark-haired man between them. Blood ran from a hole in the skin above his clavicle. Pa! Emma hollered for her father and then turned to the men, pointing them to the cot in the front room. Who is he? she asked as her father thundered into the room. A bounty hunter. He was trying to apprehend Frank Monroe when he was shot. Emma, get me a wet rag, her father said, as he crouched in front of the cot. I can't see the wound through all the blood. Emma grabbed a clean towel and soaked it in the wash basin. After giving it a quick wring out, she hurried it over to her father. He began wiping away the dried blood and cleaning out the wound. The unconscious man moaned, but his eyes remained closed. Emma bit her lip as she watched the blood continue to pour out of the hole. 
Having grown up watching and helping her father, she wasn't squeamish about injuries. But watching people die was something she would never get used to. She didn't know if his wound was fatal, but gunshot wounds often were. Can you pick him up? Her father asked. I need to see if the bullet exited the other side. The two men did as he asked, and Emma peered over their shoulders. There was an exit wound, slightly larger and spouting even more blood, but it wasn't as large as she expected. She had little experience with gunshot wounds, but she was almost certain not all of the bullet had come out the other side. Emma, get my glasses and the tweezers, please. Emma hurried over to the desk and grabbed his glasses off the top, then opened the drawer to find the tweezers, returning quickly with both. Her father put the glasses on and peered closer to the wound before taking the tweezers and poking inside the wound. A few metal fragments dropped onto the bed beside the man. Her father made another pass, but this time the metal instrument returned empty. I'm afraid there are more fragments, he said, shaking his head sadly, but I can't see them. The best I can do now is stitch him up and hope for the best. And pray, Deputy Jennings added. Her father nodded and motioned for Emma to grab the needle and thread. She sent up a silent prayer for the unknown man as she did. After splashing a little alcohol on the wound, her father began to stitch, first the entrance and then the exit wound. If the man survived, he would have quite the scar. He was lucky the bullet had hit where it had. Any further down and it would have shattered his clavicle. A little to the left and it would have torn open his neck. Somehow the bullet had managed to slice cleanly through only flesh, missing both muscles and bones. I'm afraid that's all I can do for him, her father said as he finished. Emma handed him a clean towel to wipe his hands on. Did you at least catch the fella for him? We did, Sheriff Johnson said with a nod. We also had to bring in Nellie Watson, too, as she evidently warned the fugitive and attacked the bounty hunter here. We'll have to find out what that was about. Indeed, her father said. Well, I'll stay with our friend here tonight, and we'll see how his condition is tomorrow. As long as we avoid an infection, he should heal, but it's a good thing you brought him in as quickly as you did. The sheriff and the deputy tipped their hats before exiting the clinic. Why don't you head home, Emma? I'm sure the others will be wanting dinner soon. The others consisted of her four younger siblings, Samuel, who was 20, Carrie at 16, Benjamin, who was 12, and Jenny brought up the rear at 6. It had been Jenny's birth that had taken their mother, and Emma had stepped in to be the mothering role. It was probably one reason why she wanted children of her own so badly. Carrie was old enough now to be taking on the homestead responsibilities. In fact, she had taken over when Emma married. But after Joseph died and Emma moved back home, Carrie had let Emma take over cooking dinner and putting Jenny to bed again. Okay, Pa, let me just soak these towels so the blood doesn't stain. Emma gathered the bloody cloths and dumped them in the wash basin. Hopefully, the soak overnight would remove the blood and she could scrub them in the morning. Will you be home at all tonight, Pa? No, I'll probably stay with him tonight. I don't know if he'll make it through the night, and no man should die alone. You can take my place tomorrow and I'll get some sleep then. Okay, Pa. Emma hugged him and planted a quick kiss on his cheek. See you in the morning. The sun was just dropping below the buildings as Emma exited the clinic. Normally, she loved the red, orange, and purple that colored the West Texas sky like a vivid painting. Some days, she would spend her time pondering the greatness of God to create such a beautiful tapestry of colors. But tonight, her attention was consumed by the unknown man. Who was he? Did he have a family waiting for him somewhere? The thought of him dying in this town where no one seemed to know who he was saddened her. Emma thought back to the night Joseph had told her he was taking a job with the rangers. Why do you have to go? she asked. It's my duty, Joseph said. When I signed up with the rangers, it wasn't just to protect the town I live in. 
It was to be available for service whenever needed. This time they need my help rounding up a dangerous man. He's robbed and tortured dozens of people. Those people need my help. Emma bit her lip. She knew his ranger position was important to him, but they'd only been married a month, and now he was leaving. Do you know how long you might be gone? She asked in a small voice. As long as it takes, he said, planting a kiss on her forehead. But my best guess is a week, maybe two. A week. She could handle a week. The day would keep her busy with cleaning and sewing. Maybe she could even help her father out like she did before she married. But the nights were another thing entirely. She'd be alone in the house, but she would be brave. For Joseph. She pasted what she hoped was a brave smile on her face. Okay, be safe and remember that I love you. I love you too. The week had turned into nearly two, and Emma had lain awake each of those nights, wondering if he would ever come home. And then her worst nightmare had come true, and the night had come when she'd received word that he would never return home. Was there a woman somewhere right now worrying as Emma had back then? Hi, Emma. I hope you don't mind, but I started dinner, Carrie said, when Emma entered the house a few minutes later. While one day she hoped to have her own house again, for now, Emma enjoyed living right on the edge of town. It allowed her to walk to her father's clinic without having to bother with a horse. Of course I don't mind. You're welcome to make dinner any day you'd like. Emma smiled at her younger sister. You are an amazing cook. Well, I'm not as good as you, Carrie said, blushing and dropping her head. But you had Ma around a little longer to learn from. Emma wrapped her arm around the girl, a younger version of herself with long blonde hair and green eyes. I'm sorry you didn't have Ma as long as I did, but you are just as good a cook as I am, maybe even better. Emma! Jenny's excited voice echoed through the small house, and a moment later the girl appeared, her dark hair flying behind her. Jenny was the spitting image of their mother, with her brown hair and blue eyes. While Emma couldn't fault her for it, seeing Jenny always pulled at Emma's heartstrings and made her miss their mother more. Hi, Jenny Bean, Emma said, squatting down to hug the girl. I'm not a bean, Jenny said laughing. Though this was a nightly game with them, Jenny never seemed to tire of it. You're not... Emma feigned surprise. No, I'm a girl. Jenny put her little hands on her hips and turned her nose up in the air. Well, be a good girl and go call your brothers in for supper. Jenny nodded and spun on her heel, hollering as she went. Benjamin, Samuel, supper's ready. Not quite what I had in mind, Emma said with a chuckle and a shake of her head. Is Pa not coming for dinner? Carrie asked as she headed to the kitchen. No, there was an altercation at the saloon tonight and a man was shot. Pa is staying to watch him and be there in case he passes in the night. Carrie's hand flew to her mouth and her eyes grew large and round. Oh, how awful! Emma nodded. It is, and I keep wondering if he has family out there somewhere, wondering where he is. Did it remind you of Joseph? Carrie asked as she pulled dishes from the cupboard. A sad smile played across Emma's lips. It did, but then a lot of things remind me of Joseph. Do you think you'll ever marry again? Carrie asked in a soft voice as she dished up the stew. Maybe one day, Emma said, taking the full bowls to the table. If God sends me the right man... Her heart would always belong to Joseph, but she couldn't deny the desire to have a family of her own. Chapter 2 William William smiled at Catherine as they walked through the tall grass. The sun was especially bright today, and he couldn't remember a time when she looked more beautiful. Golden threads sparkled in her hair as if the sun itself had kissed her strands. 
Her hazel eyes twinkled as she smiled at him. I thought I'd never see you again. He took her hand, her perfect porcelain dainty hand, relishing the soft touch of her skin against his. I'm always here watching you. Catherine tilted her head to the left as she gazed at him. But you have to move on, William. Move on? His brows knit together as a cold feeling erupted in his stomach. It's not your time yet. Her soft and soothing voice calmed his nerves, as did the hand she placed on his cheek. Don't spend it alone, though. Find love again. William shook his head adamantly. No, Catherine, you are my love. There won't be another. Bounty hunting has become my life now. That is no life, Catherine said with a small smile. You need to live, and you need to open your eyes. As the words left her mouth, the sun grew brighter and the green grass faded away. Catherine slipped backwards out of his touch. William stretched out his hand for her, but she was always just out of his reach until she too disappeared. He awoke with a gasp and a stinging pain descended. The throbbing in his neck was so pronounced he felt as if he could see the beat of it in his head, and there was a stiffness where his neck met his shoulder, keeping him from being able to move his head. The wood planks he could see were unfamiliar to him, and his hand felt instinctively for his gun, but came up empty. Easy now, a female voice said, and a pretty face entered his view. Blonde locks circled her heart-shaped face and complimented her green eyes. You were shot, and my father isn't sure he got all the shards out. You need to stay still and let your wound heal. There may still be fragments close to your neck. Shot. The previous night flashed into William's mind and he jerked again, trying to sit up. No, you have to stay still, the woman insisted, pushing firmly on his chest to keep him down. He stopped struggling. The pain was too great to continue anyway. Instead, he swallowed to wet his throat and asked, Did they get Monroe? His voice came out hoarse and barely more than a whisper. The cattle thief? the woman asked. With deliberate effort, William nodded. Though painful, he found he could move his head if he did it slowly. Yes, they got him. Nellie, too. It turns out she is his cousin. With a small sigh, William relaxed against the pillow. At least his mark hadn't escaped, though he probably wouldn't get the full bounty for him since local law enforcement had been forced to step in. I'm Mrs. Stewart, the woman continued, and my father is Doc Moore. We're going to be taking care of you while you heal. Do you have any family we should notify? William moved his head the little he could. The only family he had was the rapidly fading memory of the dream of Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Mrs. Stewart's face clouded with sympathy. Well, rest for now. I'll be with you all day, so just ring this if you need me. She held up a little silver bell for him to see and then placed it in his right hand, folding his hand around the bell. William started at the feel of her touch on his bare hand. How long had it been since a woman's gentle touch had affected him? Too quickly, the warmth of her hand left his, and he was left alone with his thoughts. He wasn't generally the worrying type, but what if this injury halted his career? What would he do then? There was nothing for him back in Barefoot Glen anymore. It was one reason he had accepted the bounty hunter proposition. He had loved serving as a deputy, but after Catherine had been killed by a stray bullet during his watch, life had lost its meaning. At least the money from collecting bounties filled part of the void in his heart. But if this injury kept him from performing his duties, he didn't know what he would do. Emma Emma stole another glance at the man lying on the cot. He was handsome with his dark hair and chiseled features, so she had trouble believing he had no family. What had made him choose such a solitary life as being a bounty hunter? 
She grabbed the towels from the wash basin and headed for the back door, grabbing the washboard and a bar of soap on the way. A water pump and a bucket sat just outside for her to wash the clinic's laundry and fill the wash basin when needed. Emma pulled up the nearby stool and began priming the pump until the water flowed out and filled the bucket. She stuck the washboard in the bucket and began scrubbing the still pink towels. Well, hello, Emma. I hear you have a bounty hunter in your care. Emma sighed at Carl's voice. They had grown up together and courted for a time until Joseph had come into her life. Carl had stepped aside, though not graciously, when it became clear her affections lay with the other man. But since Joseph's death, he had begun coming around again in hopes of a second chance with Emma. The problem was she had no interest in him. Yes, Carl, we do. He was shot last night and he needs his rest, so I hope you weren't thinking of bothering him. Bothering? I'm never a bother, Emma. You should know that. He leaned against the back post just a few feet from her. Right. Never a bother. What can I do for you, Carl? Emma asked, using the soap to take her aggravation for Carl out on the towels. I wanted to see if you would like to come riding with me tomorrow. Oh, I don't think I can, Carl. I've got this patient, and I promised Pa I'd help him out. It would just be for a few hours, Emma. Surely Doc Moore can handle the clinic for a few hours. He probably could, her father's voice interrupted the conversation, and Emma glanced gratefully at him. But I've been called to Opdyke West tomorrow for a few days so Emma will have to take care of our guest on her own. I'm afraid riding will have to wait. Understood, sir. Carl had the decency to answer and nod politely before walking away. Thank you, Pa, Emma said as she pulled the towel out of the bucket. It wasn't as white as it had once been, but she felt sure it was as clean as it was going to get. She stood and placed it over the railing to begin drying, before grabbing another towel. You're welcome, her father said, but I was stating the truth. I'm going to check on our guest and make sure he can be moved. It would make me feel better for you to watch him at the homestead than to stay at the clinic overnight. I know Samuel is old enough, but I always feel better with you at home to watch out for the little ones. Do you think he can be moved? Emma asked, concern coloring her voice. He could barely speak to me earlier. He's stiff and sore, but I think if we get some men to help us load him in a wagon and unload him at the house, that he'll be fine. However, I'm going to perform an examination to be sure. Emma nodded as her father went back in the clinic. The stranger was going to be in their home for the foreseeable future. She wasn't sure how she felt about that, but it did make sense if her father was going to be gone. This way, she could monitor the stranger and help out her siblings at home. Thankfully, the stranger was in no condition to take advantage of them, and having Samuel there would help dispel any notion of inappropriateness. She finished washing the other towels, and then brought them and the washboard inside. In one of the back rooms, a line of string had been strung across the room to serve as a clothesline. Emma draped the towels over the line before continuing to the main room. Ah, Emma, just in time, her father said. I've examined Mr. Cook here, and while he still has a long road of healing, I do believe he is able to travel. I'm going to find a few able-bodied men in a wagon, and I shall return. I hear you're to be my private nurse, Mr. Cook said in a hoarse whisper after her father left. Emma felt a heat sprout up her neck. I will be your primary caretaker, but I assure you there will be nothing private about it. My father is bringing you to our homestead, and I have four younger brothers and sisters, ranging in age from six to twenty. The man blanched slightly before asking, I don't suppose I have much choice, do I? With a smile, Emma shook her head. I'm afraid not. My father is quite stubborn once he's made up his mind, and since he has been called to another town for a few days, he feels this is the most prudent course of action. 
Unfortunately, some of the smaller towns around here don't have a doctor in town and have to send for Pa. You're lucky you didn't get shot in one of those towns. I suppose you're right, he said with a slight smile. But won't your husband mind you being away from him for so long? My husband is deceased, Emma said softly. Oh, I'm sorry, he mumbled. Thank you. Well, you appear to be feeling a little better after your rest, Emma added, changing the conversation's direction. I'm a fast healer, Mr. Cook said, though I'd be lying if I said I wasn't feeling any pain. My neck still feels as if it's on fire and my throat is parched. I could get you some water if you'd like, Emma offered. I would like that, Mr. Cook said, and Emma scurried to the back room to grab a metal cup and fill it with water from the pump. When she returned, her brow furrowed as she questioned how best to give him the drink. Her father had said he shouldn't move much, but she would need to sit him up a little or he might choke on the water. She set the cup down on the nearby table and perched on the edge of the cot. This is probably going to hurt a bit, but I'm going to need to lift your head so you can drink. I can handle the pain, he said, but she saw a flicker of fear in his green eyes. As gingerly as she could, Emma slid her arm under his neck and pulled upwards. She saw him flinch and a low moan escaped his lips, but she was able to get him up enough to drink. He downed half of the liquid in the cup before signaling he was through. After placing the cup back on the table, Emma lowered him back to the cot and removed her arm, but not before a tingling sensation flooded her arm. The sensation wasn't new to her, of course, but why was she feeling it for this stranger? It was probably nothing, just her body reacting to an unusual touch. Emma glanced at Mr. Cook, but his eyes were closed, and his chest rose and fell in a labored pattern, as if that had been more painful than he was letting on. If a mere drink caused this much pain, how was she going to get him to eat? He'd probably have to live on broth and soup for a few days until the pain became more manageable. As she stood, the door of the clinic opened, and her father entered with Deputy Jennings and Mr. Brown, the owner of the mercantile. Good news, Mr. Cook, her father said. Mr. Brown here has a long wooden board we can use as a stretcher for the trip. If we tie your head and feet to the board, it should limit the movement and save you a great deal of pain. Pa, just lifting him to give him a drink a moment ago caused him a great deal of pain. Are you sure moving him is wise? Emma whispered in her father's ear. She didn't want to question his decision in front of the other men. He patted her hand. Don't worry, my dear. It will be fine. Emma watched helplessly as the wooden plank was brought in. It was balanced across a stool and held in place by her father as Deputy Jennings hooked his arm under Mr. Cook's, and Mr. Brown took his feet. On the count of three, they hoisted Mr. Cook onto the plank, eliciting another small groan from the man. Then her father began wrapping bandages around Mr. Cook's head and the top of the board, and then around his feet and the bottom of the board. When the wrapping was finished, the two men lifted the stretcher and Emma and her father followed them out of the clinic. Her father took a moment to lock the door before asking, Emma, why don't you and I ride in the back of the wagon with Mr. Cook to help keep him from being jostled? Yes, Pa, Emma said, before climbing into the back of the wagon. Mr. Cook's eyes were still closed and wrinkled lines marred his forehead letting her know he was still in pain. Her father climbed up across from her, and between the two of them, they managed to keep the stretcher relatively still on the short ride to their house. Emma, go and make up my bed for Mr. Cook here, her father instructed, as the wagon came to a stop in front of the house. And see if you can keep the children occupied with something until we get him comfortable. Emma nodded and climbed down from the wagon, careful not to disturb Mr. Cook and cause him any more pain. As she reached the porch steps, the door swung open and Jenny ran out. You're home early? Does that mean we get to play? Jenny danced from one foot to the other in excitement. 
Maybe in a bit. I need to get father's bed made for a guest who will be staying with us, Emma said, patting her sister on the head before stepping by her. Who's our guest? Ginny asked, pulling on Emma's skirt as she followed her into the house. His name is Mr. Cook. He is a bounty hunter who was shot and needs us to look after him for a few days. He was shot? Benjamin asked with interest, looking up from the kitchen table where he was studying. Yes, but you are not going to bother him, Emma admonished. He is going to need his rest. Ah, shucks. Benjamin grumbled under his breath, but he dropped his eyes back to his paper. Emma pushed open the door to her father's room. He was rarely home except to sleep, so there was very little out of place. She quickly smoothed the sheets and plumped the pillow before turning back to the door where she ran right into Jenny, who had been watching her every move. Is he handsome? The young girl asked. What? Emma asked as she stepped around the girl again. The guest, is he handsome? Jenny pressed again. I suppose, Emma said. She had noticed his chiseled features and his intriguing green eyes, but she had been more concerned with caring for him than noticing if he was handsome. Would you marry him? Jenny asked in a sing-song voice, stopping Emma in her tracks. She whirled on the girl, her hair flying out behind her. There will be no talk of marriage. He is a guest in our house to get better, not to get fixed up with someone. Emma felt a smidgen of guilt over her words when Jenny's face dropped. I'm sorry, Jenny. Why don't you see if Benjamin needs any help with his studying? The little girl's lip protruded in a small pout, but she did as she was asked. With a sigh, Emma resumed her task of returning to the wagon waiting outside. Okay, Pa, your bed is ready. The men moved into action. Her father climbed down from the back, and Deputy Jennings and Mr. Brown hopped down from the front. They inched the stretcher out until they were able to each take an end. With her father holding the middle to keep it as still as possible, the men walked with a steady gait into the house and to her father's room. Emma noticed that Mr. Cook's eyes remained closed, though she wasn't sure if it was by choice or if he had simply passed out again. The men placed the stretcher on the side of the bed, and then, as before, lifted Mr. Cook by the armpits and the feet to place him on the bed. As no groan accompanied this move, Emma assumed he had lost consciousness. She grabbed a nearby blanket and pulled it over him before following the men out of the room and shutting the door behind her. Thank you both, her father said to the other two men as they exited the front door. Benjamin he said, turning to his youngest son. Go find Samuel and hitch up my wagon, please. Where are you going, Pa? Jenny asked in a timid voice as Benjamin left the house. To Opdyke West for a few days, her father answered. Emma will be in charge. Where's Carrie? Here, Pa, Carrie said as she emerged from the bedroom the girls shared. Carrie, can you take over cooking dinner for the next few days? Emma may have her hands full with our guest. Of course, Pa. Good. Now, Emma, listen carefully. You'll need to monitor his heart rate often to make sure he isn't going into shock. Change the dressing once a day, but otherwise keep it covered to keep germs out. His neck will be sore, but he should be able to sit propped up, and he'll probably need soup or broth for a day or two, but then get him on soft food. As soon as he's able, get him walking around. Emma nodded, trying to memorize his instructions before asking, What if he goes into shock, Pa? Keep him comfortable, cover him with a blanket, and send Samuel to get me. Emma nodded as the door opened, and Samuel and Benjamin stepped inside. The wagon's ready, Pa, Samuel said. Good, help out your sisters while I'm gone, and keep an eye on the stranger. The shotgun is by the front door, her father said. He hugged each of them before exiting. Emma exhaled and sent up a silent prayer that everything would be okay while her father was gone. Chapter 3 
William. Though the throbbing in his neck had lessened, the pain in William's stomach had now replaced it. He was hungry. His hand reached for the silver bell, but it wasn't there. A few further pats of the area near his hand yielded no result either. Where was the woman? In fact, where was he? William's neck was still stiff, but he could tell from what he could see that the room was different, homier. The previous events flooded back into his mind. They had moved him from the clinic to the doctor's house. How long had he been out? The door opened and the pretty woman entered, carrying a tray with a bowl and a cup on it. Oh, good, you're awake, she said upon seeing him. I brought you some soup my sister Carrie made and some water. Do you feel up to eating? His stomach felt up to much more than just soup, but he wasn't sure how his neck would feel when he tried to sit up. I'm starving, he said. The woman smiled. What was her name again? And set the tray on a nearby table. As she reached behind him to move the pillow up, the sweet scent of vanilla and sugar filled his senses. Trying to ignore the tempting smell, William pushed against the bed and struggled to sit up. With a great deal of pain and a minor amount of groaning on his part, he managed to get into an upright position. Are you in too much pain? The woman asked, her face scrunched in sympathy. It's fine, William said through clenched teeth. Stuart, that was her name, Mrs. Stuart. My father recommended just soup for a few days to make sure your wound is mostly healed before you do a lot of chewing, but I promise it's good soup. Thank you, Mrs. Stewart, he said, taking the soup bowl from her. A soft pink flooded her cheeks. I think, since you'll be staying with us for the next few days, that you can call me Emma. William brought the bowl to his lips and managed a large gulp before lowering it and stating, and you can call me Bill. Emma's nose scrunched, and her face contorted with a look of displeasure. Bill? Is that your full name? No, it's William, he said. You don't like Bill? Bill sounds like an outlaw's name. If it's all the same, I will call you by your God-given name of William. William stared at the woman. He should be offended, but he detected no ill will in her statement and he rather liked the way William rolled off her tongue. That's fine, he said, and brought the bowl to his lips to hide his smile. Though it still hurt to swallow, it was manageable pain, and William quickly finished the bowl of soup and the water. Would it be possible to get some more? He asked, as the grumbling in his stomach was barely abated. Emma's eyebrows inched up her forehead. I see you've gotten your appetite back. Yes, I'll get you some more, but first I need to change your dressing. He agreed, but he didn't tell her that the thought of her gentle touch sent his heart beating faster. As Emma leaned over him, he could see tiny flecks of gold in her green eyes, and he was drawn to them like a man to a mirage. He hadn't felt a draw like that since Catherine. Catherine, the image of her bleeding out in the street filled his mind. Even though he'd been a deputy sheriff, he hadn't been able to protect her. He pushed thoughts of Catherine and Emma out of his mind. He didn't need that pain again, and she needed a man who could protect her. Emma pulled back the dressing and a grimace crossed her face. She tried to recover and quickly averted her eyes, but William had seen the shock, residing there. Is it bad? William asked. No. Emma bit her lip. She was not a good liar, but he found the gesture endearing nonetheless. I just haven't treated a lot of gunshot wounds. Based on her reaction, he wondered if she had treated any gunshot wounds. Have you always helped your father out? William asked, trying to keep his mind off Emma's perfect pink lips as she cleaned the wound. Not really. I did some when I was growing up, but I really wanted to be a mother and raise a family. She touched a sensitive area of the wound and William sucked in his breath. Her eyes grew wide. 
I'm sorry. Does it hurt too badly? It's better today than it was yesterday, he said as the pain subsided. As Emma turned to grab another bandage, William fought the urge to ask her why she didn't have a family. She'd been married, and most marriages resulted in children rather quickly, unless a medical issue existed. But she'd mentioned that her husband was dead, so perhaps he had just died shortly after their marriage? Regardless, William knew he couldn't ask that question. Did you return to helping your father after your husband died? She nodded. After Joseph's death, I moved back in with my father to help with the kids and the clinic as he was traveling more. Do you... William paused, but his intrigue got the best of him, and though he wasn't sure why he cared, he held his breath as he finished the question. Hope to marry again? She tilted her head and narrowed her eyes at him. I'm sorry, he said. That was too forward of me to ask. No, it's fine. It's just that my sister asked the same thing yesterday. It's like everyone is trying to marry me off all of a sudden. She began applying the new dressing as she spoke. I hope one day to marry again, if God sees fit to send me the right man. I'm in no hurry, though. I learned a long time ago to wait for his timing. William bit the inside of his lip to keep his comments to himself. He had once invested as much stock in God as Emma seemed to, but the loss of Catherine had shaken his faith, and he was no longer sure God existed. Worse yet, William wasn't sure he cared whether God existed or not. Okay, all done. I'll go and get you more soup now. As Emma left the room, William leaned farther back into the pillow and closed his eyes. He had been hiding the pain from her, but the throbbing sensation was starting to pulse into his head. Were you really shot? He opened his eyes to see a young boy and an even younger girl staring at him. Though neither of them looked much like Emma, he assumed they must be the younger siblings. Yes, I was, but your sister just changed the dressing, so I can't show you. Did it hurt? The little girl asked, her blue eyes wide and round. William chuckled. I can't recommend it. It's definitely painful. Are you really a bounty hunter? The boy asked. Yes, I am, but again, I can't recommend it. It is how I got shot, after all. Benjamin, Jenny... Get out of here and leave our guest alone, Emma scolded as she re-entered the room with another serving of soup. It's okay, William said. They were just being curious. Yes, well, they are supposed to be doing their chores, which is what they are going to do now. Under her admonishing stare, the two younger children ducked their heads and scurried out of the room. I'm sorry, they're not used to having visitors in the house. How many of you are there? William asked. He thought she had mentioned the number once, but the previous day was still cloudy from the pain he had been in. Five, Emma answered, passing him the bowl. I'm the oldest, and Jenny is the youngest at six. The boy was Benjamin. I'm sure you'll meet Carrie and Samuel, the older two, soon enough. William downed the second bowl of soup and then handed it back to Emma. Did your father say how long I would need to stay here? Emma smiled at him. Are you tired of our hospitality already? No, it's not that, William said quickly. But I still need to bring Monroe in to collect my bounty. Do you enjoy it? Emma's voice had dropped to little more than a whisper. Being a bounty hunter? It pays well, William said. But isn't it lonely? Emma continued. Don't you want more out of life than that? No, with more comes pain, and I've had enough of that to last a lifetime. Emma bit her lip as if she wanted to continue the conversation, but his tone of voice had cut her questions short. He was glad. He didn't feel like talking about the pain. Burying it and ignoring it was much easier. And though Emma had also lost a spouse— he doubted she had held her husband as she watched the life slip out of his eyes, as he had with Catherine. 
I'll be back later with supper, Emma said, heading for the door. You should get your rest. Wait, do you know where my horse is? William asked. I had her tied up at the saloon when I went after Monroe, and I have items in my saddlebag I'd like back. I'm not sure, Emma replied, but I'll send Samuel to look. If he finds your horse, he can bring her back to our barn and board her until you're feeling better. Thank you. A part of William wanted to call her back so he could explain about his pain, but he kept his mouth shut. It was better this way. He didn't need to be distracted by Emma's pretty face, and she didn't need the likes of him in her life. Emma As Emma closed her father's door and meandered into the kitchen to wash the bowl, she wondered what pain William held in his past. At only 25, she had seen enough people suffer through tragedy to recognize the signs. Her own father had displayed similar signs when their mother died, throwing himself into his work and forgetting his family for a time. Was that what had happened to William? It would make sense. He appeared to be in his early 30s, and most men were married by that time. He certainly was handsome enough to have had a wife. Emma shook her head at that thought. She had no business noticing his handsome features. William Cook was not going to remain in her life. He would be gone as soon as he was healed. He had made that evident just a moment ago. And she could never be a bounty hunter's wife. She had worried too much when Joseph was with the Rangers and then had been forced to deal with his early death. No, while she knew safety was not guaranteed in the West, she needed someone stable. Someone who would want to ranch or farm or do something less dangerous. Someone like... Carl. Emma sighed as she sat at the kitchen table. Only, she had no affection for Carl. And after having a marriage to Joseph based on affection, she wasn't sure she could settle for anything less in the future. The family Bible sitting at the edge of the table caught her eye, and Emma pulled it closer to her. Without knowing what specifically she was looking for, she flipped open the large book, landing in the book of John. An underlined verse jumped out at her. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John fourteen twenty seven. Yes, that's what she needed to do. She needed to give her troubles over to God. He had always been there for her, even when she lost Joseph and felt alone. In fact, it had been then she had felt closest to God, almost as if she could feel his loving arms around her and his fatherly voice telling her it would be okay. What you doing? Jenny's voice broke through Emma's thoughts, and she opened her eyes and smiled at her sister. I was just talking to God. For the man? Jenny asked. William? Emma asked, confused. No, more for myself, really. William, is it? Carrie asked, entering from the girl's bedroom. That girl had a knack for entering the room whenever she thought she might learn something juicy. Emma shook her head in protest, even as she felt heat climb up her neck. It's not like that. He's just going to be here for a few days, and it felt silly to keep calling him Mr. Cook. Of course it did, Carrie said. It's much harder to entertain a fantasy if you constantly have to refer to him by his last name. Speaking from experience, are you? Emma teased back. You should know that I've seen the way you look at Philip Alder in church. This time, Carrie's cheeks turned scarlet. That's not the same thing at all, she protested. Oh, isn't it? Emma said with a laugh. You're both carrying torches, Ginny shouted and pointed a finger at them. Emma and Carrie exchanged a wicked glance and then turned their attention on poor Jenny. Let's get her, Carrie said, and the two older girls began to tickle Jenny until she squealed, and they all fell on the floor in a heap of laughter. These were the things Emma had missed when she had moved out of the house, and she made a mental note to visit more often if she ever did marry and leave again. Chapter 4 William 
When William woke later in the day, the room was much darker. Someone had lit a small oil lamp on the table near the bed. Emma, probably. William wondered when she would be coming in again as his stomach still rumbled with hunger. He debated if he should holler for her or try to get out of bed himself. But after struggling to pull himself to a sitting position, he gave up and leaned back against the pillow. It wasn't that the pain was intolerable. Oh, it was still bad when he moved, but manageable. The real problem was the lack of food had made him dizzy. The room had begun spinning as soon as he tried to move to the edge of the bed. I have dinner, Emma said, entering as if she had read his mind. Is it more than soup this time? William asked over another growl from his stomach. I'm starving. It's a stew, Emma answered with a smile. Carrie put in some vegetables but softened them up for you. William hoped it would be enough. Emma set the bowl on the table and then returned to help William sit up. Though still painful, he enjoyed the soft touch of her skin and the sweet smell of her as she leaned near. When he was upright, she handed him the bowl and spoon. Samuel found your horse. She's in our barn now and he brought in your saddlebag, she said, pointing to his bag which lay on the floor against the far wall. Thank you he said after swallowing a large mouthful of the warm stew. You're welcome. She glanced toward the door, then pursed her lips and frowned. Turning her face back to him, she asked, Would you like me to read to you? You must be awfully bored laying in here all alone. William wondered if she was asking simply out of kindness or if there was some attraction on her part, but he found he didn't care. He liked her voice and he didn't want to be alone. I'd like that, he said as he spooned up another bite. The carrots and potatoes had been cooked to a tea and required very little chewing on his part, which helped with the pain. Her eyes lit up and a dimple appeared in her cheek as she smiled. Wonderful, I'll be right back. With a light step, she exited the room, returning a moment later with a large black book under her arm. William paled when he realized what the book was. He should have asked what she wanted to read to him, as he wasn't really in the mood for the Bible. Are you a fan of the Psalms? She asked, as she pulled over the wooden chair and sat down. I used to be, William said. It wasn't a complete lie. He and Catherine had often read the Psalms together. He had enjoyed them then, but he hadn't picked up a Bible since her death. Emma raised an eyebrow at him as if unsure if she should continue. But when William offered no further objection, she opened the Bible and began to read. Her voice was low and melodious, and William found himself enjoying the reading in spite of the subject matter. Before he knew it, the stew was gone, and while he wasn't completely full, it had satisfied the immediate gnawing hunger. Emma finished Psalm 121 and closed the book. You know, you received a miracle. If that bullet had hit anywhere else, you would probably be dead. God must have had an angel watching out for you. Is there anything else I can get you tonight? William was tempted to ask for another bowl of stew, but he refrained. No, I think I'm good for tonight. All right, then. She stood and took the bowl from him. Rest well, and I'll be back in the morning to check on you. William lay back and pondered her words. He knew surviving a gunshot wound in general wasn't always a guarantee, and especially one so near the neck. Could it be true that God was watching out for him? But if so, why? He certainly hadn't been giving God any of his time or attention, so why would God care about him? Emma Emma placed the Bible on the table and washed the bowl in the sink. As the water swirled in the bowl, her mind wandered to William again. Though he had let her read, she had seen him tense at the side of the Bible and had caught his vague answer about the Psalms. She wondered what hurt in his past had driven him from God's loving arms. Emma, will you read me a story before bed? Jenny asked, entering the room. Her long brown hair hung around her shoulders, and her hand-me-down nightgown touched the floor. Of course, why don't you gather everyone else and we'll all read together? 
Jenny smiled, nodded, and raced away to gather her brothers and sister. Emma dried the bowl and set it beside the sink. Would she ever have her own children to read to? She loved her siblings, but it wasn't the same. God, if you see fit, she whispered, I would love another chance at a family. Please help me be patient and wait on your timing. A moment later, Jenny returned, followed by Benjamin, Carrie, and Samuel. Emma grabbed the Bible again and sat in the middle of the couch. The two youngest sat on either side of her, and Carrie and Samuel perched on the arms of the couch. Emma flipped the pages of the Bible, thinking about what story to read. A memory from long ago, when Carrie was just a baby, flashed into her mind. Their mother had still been alive then, a vibrant young woman with dark hair and crystal blue eyes. She had often read to them at night, and Emma's favorite story had always been the birth of Jesus. Though not Christmas or Easter, she flipped to the back of the book and began to read the story of Mary. When she finished, Jenny was asleep on her lap, and Benjamin's eyes were heavy. I'll get him, Samuel said, scooping up his little brother and heading to the back room the boys shared. Emma did the same thing with Jenny, grunting a little under the weight. While not a large child, she had grown tall enough to be awkward in Emma's arms. She followed Carrie into the room they shared and laid Jenny in the large bed. It was a tight squeeze with all three of them in the bed, but Emma didn't often mind. She liked having her sisters near her, and after Joseph's death, she found no enjoyment in sleeping alone. Her own eyes closed soon after she heard Carrie's breath slow and become rhythmic. Chapter 5 William William awoke when the sun's light broke through the window. He was tired of lying in bed, and he was bored. The need to do something, anything, burned in his veins. And while the pain hadn't gone away entirely, he believed it had dulled enough that he could try moving. Remembering to take it slower this time after yesterday's fiasco, he dropped his right leg out of the bed first before pushing up with his arms. He had just achieved a sitting position with one leg out of the bed when Emma entered the room. What are you doing? She gasped, hurrying toward him and placing the tray she was holding on the table. You are supposed to be resting. She faced him with her hands on her hips and a reproachful look on her face. The look was comical on her, but William swallowed his laughter, sure she would take offense to it. I can't lay in this bed another whole day, he said instead. Please, just let me see if I can handle moving around. Her bottom lip folded under in that endearing gesture again, and he could see the indecision in her eyes. If it hurts too much, I promise I'll get back in bed, he pleaded. All right, if you promise. Though she still looked apprehensive, she held out a hand to help him up. He grasped her slender hand, ignoring the sensation that shot up his arm, and used her weight as leverage to swing his other leg out of the bed and push himself up. The pain in his neck throbbed a little, but wasn't unbearable. Unfortunately, he had stood up too quickly, and black dots encroached his vision. He felt himself start to sway. Whoa! Emma's arms wrapped around his chest to stabilize him. William's body reacted impulsively to a woman being in his arms again, and his own arms encircled her. The smell of vanilla and sugar filled his nose. When the room stopped spinning, William registered how perfectly Emma fit in his arms. His heart sped up, and his gaze dropped to Emma's face. Her green eyes met his, filled with desire and confusion. Her perfect pink lips parted, and she inhaled. William wanted to kiss her, to taste those lips, but before he could say or do anything, she stepped out of his embrace, averting her eyes and breaking the moment. I think you need more rest, she said, as she turned away from him and fiddled with something on the tray. He couldn't help but feel pleased at the pink blush on her cheeks. She must have felt something, too. Nonsense. He cleared his throat to hide the emotions he was feeling. I'm fine now. 
I just need to remember to stand more slowly next time. In that case, would you care to eat breakfast at the table with the rest of us? Emma asked. I would sure like to try, William said, as he took a hesitant step. Emma bit her lip, as if she was deciding whether he could do it on his own or she would have to help him. Though he would not mind her arms around him again, he didn't want her to feel obligated. So he took another step, this one more confident than the last. With a nod, Emma picked up the tray and led the way to the homey kitchen. The table was already filled with the younger brother and sister he had already met, as well as an elder boy and girl he had yet to meet. Carrie, can you set another place for our guest? Emma asked. A girl who appeared to be a younger version of Emma pushed her chair back and walked into the kitchen, returning a moment later with a plate and utensils. She set the plate down across from the only other empty setting at the table. You've already met Benjamin and Jenny, Emma said, pointing at the two youngest children who were shoving pancakes in their mouths. The other two are Samuel and Carrie. Carrie flashed him a small smile while Samuel nodded at William. Emma put the bowl of porridge she had brought from the bedroom at the place setting Carrie had just laid down. While the porridge looked delicious, William's stomach rumbled audibly at the sight and smell of the pancakes. Emma lifted an eyebrow. If you think you can handle it, you are welcome to try some pancakes. She pulled out the chair across from him and sat down. With a sheepish grin, William sat at the table and stabbed two pancakes with his fork. He forced himself to cut the pancakes into smaller bites, though all he wanted to do was shove the entire thing in and fill the gaping hole in his belly. The act of chewing put a little more strain on the wound, but he found he could tolerate the pain, and before he knew it, the two original pancakes were gone, along with two others he had for seconds. As he finished chewing the last bite, he looked up to see Emma staring at him, a bemused expression on her face. Guess I was hungry he said with a half smirk and a shrug of his shoulders. I suppose you were, she said with a laugh. I'm glad you were able to join us for breakfast, but I think you need to get back to bed now. Nonsense, William said. I need to walk around. My neck and shoulders are stiff, but my legs work fine, and I'm certain your father said I would need exercise when I was feeling better. As Emma bit her bottom lip, William knew he had struck gold. Their gazes locked, and William's heart did another stutter step in his chest. Before it could really ramp up, Jenny's voice broke the connection. You can go, Emma. I'll help Carrie clean up. Jenny ended this statement with a giant wink at Emma, which caused a lovely pink to bloom on Emma's porcelain cheeks. Yes, we can get this, Carrie spoke up in a similar teasing tone. William had to bite his lips to keep from smiling, not only at the girls' antics, but also at the clueless faces of their brothers. Very well, then, but we'll keep it short. Shall we, William? Emma stood and smoothed her skirt before raising her head to meet his eyes. We shall, he said, following her lead. Emma. Emma couldn't believe how her sisters had embarrassed her, but she also couldn't deny the excitement she felt about showing William the town. Would it be possible he could fall in love with it and decide to stay? What would you like to see? She asked as they stepped onto the porch. The morning sun was warm, but not hot yet, and a light breeze rustled the leaves of the trees. I don't want you out for long since it's your first bit of exercise. Why don't you show me one of your favorite spots? William asked. Elizabeth's brow wrinkled in thought. What were her favorite spots? The church, for sure. Maybe the large lavender crepe myrtle trees she had often liked to read under when she was younger. And of course, the sage fields. No one should miss their majestic bloom. All right, I'll take you through downtown to one of my favorite spots. That way you can see the rest of the town on the way. But if you get tired and need to rest, be sure to let me know. My father would have my hide if I had you out and about too soon and caused damage. 
A playful smile pulled at William's lips. I promise to be a model patient, nurse, and tell you when I need a rest. Emma blushed at the tone in William's voice. Was he simply teasing her, or could there be feelings behind his words? She led the way off the porch and towards town. Doc Moore's house was on the opposite side of town from the saloon, and Emma was happy to be able to avoid the place. Not only was it a morally decrepit den, but she figured William wouldn't enjoy a reminder of his injury there. On their side of town was the schoolhouse, a large building that at this point still held only one room. But Emma had heard the men in town talking about the need to build a separation in the room. This is our schoolhouse, Emma said. It's quiet today as it's Saturday, but I really don't know how Margaret Goodman keeps up with all the children. It can be awfully noisy during lunchtime. I bet, William said, chuckling. The church appeared next, its white exterior gleaming in the sun. This is one of my favorite places, Emma said to William. I've always loved this building. It's like I feel God stands at the door welcoming us each week. Emma noticed that William glanced quickly at the building and then away. Again, she wondered what pain had distanced him from God. This is the cafe, Emma pointed out the next establishment. We don't often eat here as it's too expensive to feed a family of six. But Pa took us once for a special treat, and the food is excellent. Her smile froze on her face, though, when Carl exited the restaurant and looked up at them. Oh, so you're too busy to ride with me, but not too busy to show some stranger around our town? Carl asked with a sneer. Carl, this is Mr. Cook, the man who was shot. He felt up to some exercise today, so I am merely allowing him a supervised walk, Emma said with a small sigh. Not that it's any of your business. Mr. Cook, huh? Carl turned his attention to William. The bounty hunter, right? Are you planning on sticking around once you heal? William stared at Carl. I am not. I have to turn Monroe into the authorities, and then I'm sure I'll have more jobs to attend to. Though as Miss Stewart said, I'm not sure how that is any of your business. Carl narrowed his eyes at William. Let's just say I have a vested interest in your leaving. He flashed a smile at Emma before tapping the brim of his hat. I'll see you in church tomorrow, Emma. Curling her hands into fists, Emma watched Carl walk away. He had once been a close friend, but he had no right to act as if he owned her. What's with him? William asked when Carl was far enough away not to hear them. With a shake of her head, Emma continued walking. We courted for a time until I met Joseph. Now that I'm a widow, he thinks he has some claim on me. But you don't feel the same? William asked. Avoiding the question, Emma stated, Come on. She led him down a side street and toward the outer part of town where the large lavender crepe myrtle trees sat overlooking the creek. We aren't seeing the rest of downtown? William asked. Short walk, remember? Plus, there are beautiful things in Sage Creek outside of downtown you should see as well. William's brows pulled together as if confused, but he followed her, keeping his questions to himself. The downtown buildings faded into smaller houses. When the tree came into sight, Emma heard William's intake of breath beside her. Isn't it gorgeous? She asked. It looked especially pretty today in full bloom, with bright purple flowers covering the tips of the branches. It's a sight for sure, he said. How long has this tree been here? I'm not sure, Emma said, sitting down against the trunk. As the tree stood about 20 feet, it had a thick enough trunk to lean against. As long as I've been here anyway, I used to love to come here and read in the afternoons. She patted the ground beside her in an invitation to sit. William looked unsure at first, but finally managed to adjust his position enough that he appeared comfortable. In order to share the trunk, he had to sit quite close to Emma, and she could feel the warmth radiating from him. 
You asked me about Carl, she said, returning to the previous conversation. I might have married him once if I had never met Joseph. Carl is loyal and predictable, and I've known him since we were children, but I was never in love with him. Of course, out here you don't often get to marry for love. Emma glanced at William before dropping her eyes to the blades of grass around her knee. Then one day, Joseph rode into town. He was strong and brave and daring, and he swept me off my feet. Her voice faded as she thought back to the day Joseph had proposed to her. Oh my, that was so much fun, but could we take a short break? Emma asked, fanning herself. That last dance wore me out. Of course, Joseph said, taking her hand and leading her off the dance floor. He led the way to the hayloft where bales of hay were set up. After smoothing down the prickly pieces, Joseph laid his coat down for Emma to sit on. When they were seated, he grabbed her hands. I know it's only been a few months, Emma, but I was taken by you the first time I met you. I never thought I'd be one to stay in the same place for very long, but I can see a life with you here in Sage Creek. Emma's breath caught in her throat. Was he about to propose? I've already asked your father, so now I'm officially asking you. Will you marry me, Emma Moore? Her heart soared as she nodded. Of course I'll marry you. The memory faded, and Emma glanced at William. Though our marriage was short, it was full of love. When he died, I knew my prospects were slim. I suppose I could have stayed in the house Joseph built, but there were too many memories, and it isn't always safe for a woman to be alone, especially at night. So I had two choices. I could return to my father's house or marry another. Carl proposed to me the day after we buried Joseph, but I just couldn't do it. I may never find another marriage based on love, but I refuse to give up hope just yet. A silence fell, and Emma looked at William from lowered lids. Have you ever been married? She asked, dropping her eyes back to the ground as the words left her lips. I was, he said. Like your husband, she died too early. He said nothing more, and Emma knew better than to push. What did your husband do, if you don't mind me asking? William said after a long pause. He was a member of the Texas Rangers, Emma replied. I thought at first that sounded romantic, but I spent a lot of nights alone, and when he went out on his last job after some bandit named Holden, I worried every night. I just had a feeling that something was wrong. It turned out I was right. Are you okay? She asked noticing William's pale face. Yes, I'm fine. But his eyes were wide when he turned them from her. I think I'm just getting a little tired. Could we continue the tour another time? Of course. Emma adjusted her skirts and stood. Though he did look tired, his reaction had occurred so suddenly that Emma wondered if it were more from something she said. She replayed the conversation in her head as they walked back to the homestead, but she couldn't for the life of her figure out why he would be affected by her husband's death. Chapter 6 William William woke before the sun. He had spent the rest of the afternoon the day before and most of the night trying to decide if he should tell Emma what he knew, and if so then how? He should have put the name together when she first mentioned her husband, but he had served with so many men. Neither Joseph nor Stuart was a highly unusual name, but when Emma mentioned John Holden, the details had come flashing back. After Catherine's death, William had no longer felt he could serve the town of Barefoot Glen any longer. After all, if a deputy couldn't protect his own wife, what good was he? He had turned in his badge, packed up his horse, and headed for some place to clear his head. Where he had landed was Austin, Texas, where Ben Wallace had sold him on the benefits of being a Texas Ranger. With nothing tying him down, William had agreed, and enjoyed riding with the other men until the day he was approached by Jack Hardesty. 
Are you Wild Bill Cook? William looked up at the visitor. He had been given the nickname a few months into becoming a ranger, as his fearless attitude became known. But he didn't recognize this man with his tan skin, dark hair, and handlebar mustache. I am. What can I do for you? Actually, the man said with a small smile, it's more about what I can do for you. I don't understand, William said, shaking his head. Your reputation has preceded you, and I think you would make a great bounty hunter. I'm here to offer you a job. I already have a job, William said, dropping his gaze back to the desk. Yes, but I doubt it can pay like this. The man slid a paper across the desk and into William's gaze. William had no real need for more money, as he had no family to support, and the ranger pay was more than enough to cover his needs. But there was something about seeing all those zeros that grabbed his attention. His eyes widened as he read the information. Four thousand dollars? The man nodded. And that's just your cut, because this job is so big, a few of us are being called in. Normally, you'd work alone and earn at least double that. What do you need me to do? William asked, meeting the man's eyes again. You'll need to round up some good rangers. We're wanting at least 20 men on this takedown. John Holden is not one to underestimate. And that was how Joseph Stewart had become involved. William had rounded up a few men from Austin and then sent out telegrams to surrounding areas. Joseph Stewart had been one of many who had thrown their hats in the ring. The men knew going after outlaws was dangerous, but even William had never suspected how dangerous this one was. He wondered now why Stewart had joined. If the man had recently married, why had he been willing to take on a job that might be dangerous? Had he needed the money? Being a ranger didn't pay as well as bounty hunting, but it would have been a nice sum anyway. Perhaps it had been for the money, or perhaps just the sense of duty. William tightened his grip on the reins with one hand, while the other sat on the hilt of his revolver. A glance around revealed the other men in a similar position. They had been tracking the infamous John Holden for days, and finally their undercover operative had told them Holden was on a train headed for Dallas. The train, now sat in front of them, stopped on the tracks by the deputies on board. Jack Hardesty, the leader of this roundup, had managed to get a few deputies on the train at the last station. Now the group outside was simply waiting for the sign that Holden had been apprehended. A shot rang out in the air, and the men sprang into action. Several men dismounted and headed for the main door of the train with their guns drawn. A door towards the back of the train slid open, and a man jumped out. It's Horace Gilbert, one of the men shouted out. Don't let him get away. Gilbert was Holden's right-hand man and almost as bad as Holden. William turned his horse in that direction and motioned his rangers to follow him. Gilbert had gotten a head start on them, but they were faster on horses and quickly saw him ducking through the tall sage grass. Holding his arm as steady as he could, William fired off a shot. It missed, but must have been close as Gilbert quickly shifted direction. A few more shots went off around William as the other men aimed and fired. None of them hit the mark either, despite being good marksmen, but it was much harder to hit a running, zigzagging target. Taking a deep breath, William focused his eyes on the suspect and fired another shot. This time, Gilbert went down. By the time William reached the area, another ranger was hauling him to his feet. His shot had hit Gilbert's shoulder, but it appeared to be just a flesh wound. Nice work, Cook, one of his rangers said as he secured Gilbert's hands behind his back. William nodded and tapped his hat, all in a day's work. He had always been a decent shot, but had rarely used it until Catherine's death when a drunken brawl poured out into the streets. The bullet had hit her as she exited the mercantile, and William had watched as she fell, and the contents of her bag spilled into the street. He turned his horse around and headed back to the train to make sure Holden had also been apprehended. 
William was almost to the train when he heard the gunfire behind him. Turning quickly, he saw Gilbert had managed to get a hand free and had grabbed the gun of one of the nearby rangers. A bullet took Gilbert down, but not before William saw two of his men fall. William raced back to the scene. Three of his men lay on the ground along with Gilbert, who had been shot in the chest. Sorry, boss. Henry, one of the rangers he worked closely with in Austin, said, He managed to grab Joseph's gun and had him, Harry, and Arthur shot before we knew what happened. William cursed his stupidity as he dismounted. He should have stayed to make sure Gilbert was secure before checking in on Holden. Harry Givens moaned on the ground. He'd taken a shot to the arm, but would probably be okay. Arthur Jones and Joseph Stewart lay still. As they were both men from other cities who had answered his call for help, William knew nothing about them. Load them all up, William ordered. We can at least send their bodies home. He turned away before the emotion displayed on his face. This was his fault. The door to the room banged open, shattering his walk down memory lane. Jenny raced into the room. You're not up yet, she asked. You have to get up. It's church day. Oh, I don't usually go to church, William said. Why not? The little girl asked, her face scrunching in confusion. Well, because God took something I loved, he replied. Jenny stared at him. So you haven't felt like worshiping him since? That's right, I haven't, he said. I know how that feels, she said, dropping her eyes and twisting her foot into the floor. Pastor Lewis always says that we might not choose or understand the things God allows, but we should trust his plan and continue to follow him. William stared at the doll-faced girl. Her blue eyes were innocent and childlike, so in contrast to the profound words that had just escaped her mouth. How did you get so knowledgeable? He asked. I had to talk with Pastor Lewis a lot when I realized Mommy died giving me life. That's a lot for a six-year-old to carry, you know? William bit his lip to keep from smiling at the girl. Her words were heartbreaking and not funny, but the seriousness in which she said them created a funny image in his head. Yes, I can see how that would be a lot to carry he said. Who did God take from you? She asked. He paused. Did he really want to reopen this wound? However, she had been brave enough to share about her mother, and she was only six, so he couldn't see the harm. My wife. God took my wife from me. Come to church with me. You can sit beside me, and I'll ask God to give you the comfort he's given me. Though William still had no desire to step into a church, he couldn't say no to the endearing face before him. Okay, skedaddle out of here for a minute so I can get cleaned up and I'll meet you outside. A wide smile broke out on Jenny's face. I'll tell Emma, she cried. She'll be so pleased. Before he could ask what she meant by that, Jenny had spun and raced out of the room as quickly as she entered. Still a little stiff, William walked slowly to his saddlebag and reached inside for a new change of clothes. The ones he was currently wearing were beginning to become ripe. He would have loved a bath as well, but there was no time for that. With new clothes on, he headed into the kitchen. Emma Emma looked up in surprise when William entered. He hadn't seemed the church-going type, and even though Jenny had said she had convinced him to come, Emma still hadn't believed it would happen. Plus, he was still healing. Good morning. Morning, he said. I guess I'm attending church with you, if that's all right. Of course. Everyone is welcome in the house of the Lord. Would you like some breakfast? Carrie made some eggs and bacon. Sure, and I'll take some coffee if you have some. Emma smiled as she loaded up a plate for him. I'm not much of a partaker myself, but Samuel brews some every morning before feeding the animals. They didn't have a large farm, but a few chickens to supply their eggs. 
some hogs for ham, and of course, horses. There should be some left, she said, nodding at the carafe on the stove. I'll have some then. Is that where your siblings are now? William asked, looking around the room as he pulled out a chair and sat at the table. Emma placed the plate in front of him before returning to the stove. Yes, Samuel and Benjamin are finishing up their chores, and Carrie is getting ready in our room. She poured the black liquid into a cup. Do you take milk or sugar? A dash of milk would be fine, William said. Emma added it and returned to the table, placing the steaming cup in front of William. Thank you, he said, catching her eye. He held her gaze a moment longer than necessary, and Emma felt her cheeks begin to burn. That was nice of you to agree to attend church for Jenny's sake, she said, turning away to hide the effect he was having on her. Did she tell you why? He asked as he lifted the cup to his lips. Emma shook her head. No, she simply said you agreed to come. William's eyebrow arched on his head as if he didn't believe her. She may be only six, but she had to grow up quickly when she learned about Ma. In some ways, she's a lot older than she seems. William opened his mouth to respond, but before he could, the two boys clomped into the house. The animals are fed, Benjamin said. No thanks to you, Samuel said, shooting his brother a look. He almost fell in the mud trying to feed the hogs before I was ready. But I didn't. Benjamin pulled back his shoulders and puffed out his little chest. All right, boys, Emma said. Enough arguing. Clean up. We'll be heading to church in a minute. The next few minutes were a flurry of activity as Carrie and Jenny emerged from the girls' room. Emma put the left-out dishes in the sink to be washed upon their return, and the boys reappeared with combed hair and clean shirts. Okay, let's go. Emma ushered the crew outside. Don't get dirty, she shouted to Jenny and Benjamin as they raced ahead. What kind of preacher is Pastor Lewis? William asked, falling into step beside Emma. His face appeared pinched and anxious. She glanced at him, wondering what the meaning behind the question really was. He's young, but seems very knowledgeable. He speaks often on the love of God and having a true relationship with him. I think you'll like him. Oh, good. His posture relaxed visibly. I was afraid he might be one of those fire and brimstone types, and I wasn't sure I could handle it. Emma laughed. No, we haven't had one like that in a long time, and I'm glad. I think having a relationship with God is more important than trying to scare people into believing. They arrived at the church and joined the other townspeople filing in. Emma waved at Sarah Miller as she sat next to Kate and Deputy Jennings. She caught the eye of a few of the other women in the town as she walked up the row to her family's pew. Unfortunately, she also managed to catch the eye of Carl, who glared at her when he caught sight of William behind her. Emma sighed softly. Would she never convince him he held no claim on her? Emma sat down with Jenny on her left and William on her right. She wasn't sure who was the bigger wiggler. Jenny had the normal six-year-old wiggles, but William kept shifting in his seat, crossing and then uncrossing his leg, leaning forward and then leaning back. At least he finally seemed to relax when Pastor Lewis started speaking. I came this morning with a message prepared, Pastor Lewis began, but I feel God telling me that someone here needs a different message, maybe many of you, so I hope you'll bear with me as I let God lead this message where he wants it to go. He paused for a moment as if gathering his thoughts. I had someone ask me this week, he continued, if heaven was as beautiful as you could imagine, if there was no sickness or physical ailments there, if you could rest and be reunited with loved ones, would you want to go? Of course, Emma thought to herself. That is the point of heaven, isn't it? What if you could have all those things, but Jesus wasn't there? Pastor Lewis continued. What if you had to choose? You could have the perfect place of heaven, 
or you could follow Jesus, would you still choose Jesus? A feeling of conviction settled on Emma. Though she knew the Bible said you got both, she had to wonder if she would choose Jesus if forced to make a choice. Heaven to her had always meant seeing her mother again, and recently seeing Joseph again, while Jesus had been the byproduct. Now she realized she had her priorities backwards. She ought to be looking forward to seeing Jesus in heaven, and everything else should be a byproduct. I know you all love Jesus, Pastor Lewis continued, or you probably wouldn't be here. But do you love Jesus for who he is, or do you love him for what you hope he will grant you? Are you tithing because God said we should, or because you hope by tithing that God will increase your wealth? We all have moments of selfishness, just like James and John did in Mark chapter 10, when they asked to sit at Jesus' right and left hands. But we must work through those moments and keep our vision on God. I have no doubt that when we get to heaven, it will be beautiful and amazing and pain-free. But I don't believe that will be because it's heaven. I believe it will be that way because God will be there, and we will stand in awe of him and wonder how we could have second-guessed him or put our faith in anything but him. Though Pastor Lewis continued the sermon, Emma heard very little of it. Her mind was focused on the initial words and how she could change her heart and mindset to put Jesus first in her life. Before she knew it, the service was over and Jenny was tapping her arm. It's over, she said. Oh, so it is, Emma said. Did you enjoy the message, William? I did, he said, meeting her eyes. I felt like he was speaking directly to me. That's funny. Emma smiled back softly. I felt the same way. The surrounding sounds seemed to diminish as he returned her smile. He had a nice smile, though his lips were a little crooked. She wanted to reach out and touch them, those thin, crooked lips. Can we go now? Jenny whined. I'm getting hungry. Of course. Emma shook her head to clear the thought of William's lips away. She had no business thinking about him or his lips. Let's go home and fill that empty tummy of yours. She tickled Jenny, earning a shrill giggle in return, before the girl raced out of the pew ahead of them. Look, Emma, pause back. The young girl pointed toward the back of the church before sprinting off to hug her father. Relief flooded Emma that her father was okay, followed quickly by a sense of sadness. She glanced at William beside her. With her father back and William healing as quickly as he had, her father was sure to discharge him and then William would be on his way, back to hunting outlaws and out of her life. She found she didn't want him to go. Though she believed she would never love another man the way she had loved Joseph, she could not deny there was some attraction building with William. She wanted him to stay so she could learn more about him. William's eyes met hers. Was she mistaken, or was the same disappointment etched in his gaze? Could it be that he felt something for her as well? Emma hadn't felt anything for a man since Joseph's death, and now she was developing feelings for the one man who wouldn't stick around? Pastor Lewis's words echoed again in her head. God had a plan they couldn't always see. Well, it's nice to see you up and about, her father said as they reached him. I assume Emma has taken good care of you. Indeed she has. William shot a look in Emma's direction that heated her cheeks again. Oh, except I haven't changed the dressing today, Emma said, her hand flying to her mouth. William appeared to be recovering so well she had almost forgotten it needed to be done. I can do it as soon as we get home. No need, her father waved his hand. I'll do a quick examination after lunch just to make sure everything is healing as it should be, and I can change the bandage then. A strange surge of disappointment filled Emma, and she realized she had enjoyed changing his bandage, as it gave her a reason to be close and touch him. What was wrong with her? 
Why hadn't she guarded her heart better? That will be fine, William said with a nod, and he and Emma followed the rest of their family outside and back to the house. While her father examined William, Emma helped Carrie with the roast and vegetables for lunch. Will you pay attention? Carrie shook her head as she took the knife from Emma. You very nearly cut off your finger. What's wrong with you? Do you think he'll leave right away? Emma asked. What are you talking about? Carrie asked as she finished chopping up the potatoes. Pa just got back. Why would he leave again right away? Not Pa, Emma said with a sigh. Carrie stopped chopping and stared at her. Her eyes grew round as she understood Emma's hint. Oh, William? Why? Are you developing feelings for him? I don't know, Emma said, frustrated. I've only known the man for three days, so I shouldn't be developing feelings for him, right? You had only known Joseph for a week when you were sure he was the one, Carrie pointed out as she dropped the vegetables in the boiling water. Emma thought back and realized Carrie was right. But William is different. He's not the type to stay in one place. Have you asked him? Carrie pointed the wooden spoon in her hand at Emma. Maybe he took the bounty hunter job because he had nothing keeping him in one place. And maybe he would stay if he had something or someone worth staying for. Emma bit her lip as she thought about Carrie's words. Could her sister be right? Could William stay in one place and be happy? Did she even have anything to offer him? Chapter 7 William Doc Moore stepped back and rubbed his chin. Well, your wound is healing and doesn't appear infected, but I'm still a little worried there might be fragments in your neck. If there are any, a jarring impact could cause them to shift and puncture your trachea, your windpipe. What are you saying? William asked. Though still a little stiff, the pain had lessened each day, but a part of him hoped the doctor would tell him he needed more rest with supervision. He didn't know why, but Emma had wormed her way into his thoughts. There was a definite attraction between them, and William half hoped to see where it might lead. But collecting bounties was his life. Could he give it up and stay in one place? Would she even want what little he had to offer? I'm saying you're free to go, but you should be careful. Chasing outlaws may not be the safest occupation for your condition. No, stopping hunting outlaws wasn't likely in his future. There was too much adrenaline with it, and of course, the money was nice. He didn't know what he had been thinking. He couldn't stay. But he did have one thing he wanted to do before he left. Would it be possible to stay one more night with you? I can't get Monroe out of jail until tomorrow. I'd be happy to sleep on the couch. Nonsense, Doc Moore said. You are welcome to stay another night. I'll bunk with the boys tonight. Thank you, sir. You have been too kind. William wondered if Doc Moore would be so accommodating if he knew of William's involvement in Joseph's death. It is I who should be thanking you. You keep the riffraff out of our towns, which keeps everyone safe. William averted his eyes as he thought again of Emma's husband. He hadn't kept everyone safe, but he had to find a way to tell Emma the truth. It smells like the girls have lunch ready, and I don't know about you, but I'm famished. Doc Moore patted his slightly protruding belly. The girls in Opdyke West could use some lessons from my daughters. William smiled and followed him into the kitchen, but his mind was on Emma. Maybe he could get her to take a walk with him after lunch, and he could tell her everything then. He pulled out a chair and sat down, catching Emma's eye as he did. She smiled at him, a friendly, engaging, beautiful smile, and the guilt inside him grew. With Doc Moore at the table, everyone's positions had shifted a little, and Emma ended up next to him. Let's hold hands as we pray tonight, Doc Moore said. 
William caught the flash of pink that graced Emma's fair cheeks before she held her hand out to him. He took her hand, but he couldn't enjoy the contact much as he was still thinking about how she might react to his information. Would she hate him? He certainly wouldn't blame her if she did. Would she never want to see him again? Would it matter? He was leaving, wasn't he? Amen, the family said. William blinked as he glanced around. He had been so distracted he had missed the prayer. Emma looked at him with a quizzical expression, but said nothing. William tried to stay more focused through the rest of lunch. The children took turns filling their father in on the days he had missed, and he in turn shared details of his time in Opdyke West. When everyone was finally through eating, William caught Emma's hand as she passed by him. Would you do me the honor of a walk? I'd like to finish that tour we started. Emma glanced to her father for permission, and after a nod of his head, she stated her agreement. It would be my pleasure to join you. William tried to gather his thoughts as they stepped outside, but no matter how he formed the words in his head, he couldn't make them sound right. Did you have a particular place in mind you'd like to go? Emma asked. No, let's just walk. Maybe the movement would help his brain, and he didn't think he could bear sitting while he said what needed to be said. With a nod, she led the way toward the outer rim of town. I wanted to say thank you, first of all, for inviting me to church today. I think I heard some things I really needed to hear, he began. Oh, I'm so glad, she said. Pastor Lewis has a knack for that, saying what people need to hear. Yes, I guess he does, William agreed. I wanted to tell you why I was reluctant to attend at first. Though he hadn't originally planned on bringing up Catherine, he felt that perhaps if she knew of his own suffering, she might understand his actions better. She turned a curious eye in his direction, but said nothing, and William inhaled deeply to gather the strength to continue. I once was a committed believer like you. I was married to the woman I loved, working a job I enjoyed, and I believed in a God above who was looking out for me, until the day I saw Catherine shot. Emma gasped and clutched her hand to her mouth. Oh, William. There was a fight occurring in the saloon, and the men got carried away and drew their guns. The bartender pushed them outside, but not before a few shots were fired. Catherine was leaving the mercantile and coming to meet me for lunch when the bullet hit her. I was a deputy sheriff at the time, and the front window faced the street. I heard the gunshot, and I saw Catherine crumble. I rushed into the street, but there was nothing I could do. She died in my arms. William, I'm so sorry. Emma's eyes were shiny with unshed tears. William swallowed the lump of emotion welling up and cleared his throat a few times. After Catherine, I grew angry with God. How could he love me and let my wife die? And especially like that. After Catherine's death, I joined the Texas Rangers before becoming a bounty hunter because I thought staying busy would keep me from missing Catherine. Emma stopped, turned to him, and placed her hand on his arm. I felt the same way when Joseph was taken, but God's plan is bigger than we know. If he loved us enough to send his son to die for us, then I have to trust he loves me even when things happen that I don't understand. William smiled. That's what your sister said this morning that convinced me to go. Jenny? Emma laughed and then shook her head. She is too bright for her own good sometimes. She is. William took Emma's hand from his arm and laced his fingers through hers. But I'm glad she is. I needed to hear that message this morning to realize I hadn't really been living. I had just been running. Emma's gaze locked with his, and her lips parted as she said, What do you need to be living again? William took a deep breath as he gazed into the emerald green of her gaze. Could he tell her? He didn't want the way she looked at him to change, and he feared once she knew the truth, the affection he read now would disappear. Still, he couldn't not tell her. So with a final swallow, he gathered his courage and opened his mouth. 
I need... You have some nerve, Cook. A male voice broke the moment. William dropped Emma's hands and turned to see the man from the previous day staring him down. His hands were clenched at his side and a vein bulged on his forehead. Carl, William is our guest, Emma said, obviously shocked at his behavior. Carl's brows shot up his forehead. It's William now, is it? Do you even know who this man is, Emma? I know he's a bounty hunter who was injured and needed our help. He's been nothing but nice to my family. This is Wild Bill Cook, Carl said, letting the words resonate with her. I asked around about you. He narrowed his eyes at William and venom flowed from his gaze. You thought you could hide what you'd done by changing your name, but I know who you are and what you did. I wasn't trying to hide anything, William began. Beside him, Emma gasped, halting the conversation between the two men. You, you were the ranger in charge of the Holden mission. William's face paled and his shoulders dropped, but he didn't deny it. I was. You are the reason my husband was killed, Emma said, her previous soft voice now dripping with anger. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know at first. William shook his head sadly. This wasn't how he'd wanted to tell her at all. It wasn't until you mentioned Holden yesterday that I made the connection. I spent all day yesterday and today trying to think of the best way to tell you, but I couldn't find the right words. Or didn't want to, Carl said, a satisfied smirk on his face. Emma, I'm sorry. It's why I suggested this walk. I was going to tell you everything. I... William reached out a hand to her, but Emma shook her head and backed away from him. You should have told me as soon as you knew. Her voice was low and accusatory. I need time to think. She took another step back. Don't follow me. Her eyes held William's gaze before flicking to Carl. Either of you. With that, she turned and rushed away from town. Did you honestly think she would fall for you? Carl asked, turning to William. Anger swirled through William's body. You better get out of my sight before I pretend I got my mark wrong. His hand dropped to his gun. Carl narrowed his eyes as he looked from William's wound to the gun. I've heard you are a strong shot, but do you think you could hit the mark with your wound? William returned the stare and kept his voice cool. I don't know. Do you want to find out? Carl opened his mouth as if he were going to say something more, but then thought better of it and walked away. William watched him go, his hands shaking against his thighs. He would never shoot a man in the back, but if that man had ruined his chance to tell Emma his side of the story, no, he would not retaliate. That would make him no better than Carl. He'd find another way to reach Emma. Emma. Emma didn't stop walking until she found herself in the purple sage fields. How could she have been so stupid? She had fallen not only for a man who would never stay, but for the very man responsible for her husband's death. Help me understand, God, she said aloud, as she skimmed the sage bushes with her hand. Why did you send him here, and why did you bring him into my life? I know I don't know the whole story, but help me understand at least that much. The wind blew softly around her, rustling the purple leaves, but no answer came. The fields normally filled her with peace, but no peace came this time. With a sigh, Emma turned around and headed back to the homestead. Hopefully, William would have returned, grabbed his things, and left by the time she arrived. Where's William? Carrie asked as Emma entered the house. You mean he hasn't already been here? Emma asked, a mixture of hope and anger fighting for control within her. Maybe she should have listened to his explanation. Maybe he had been about to tell her the truth. Carrie shook her head, her freckled face filled with questions. Elizabeth shook away the hope, letting the anger take over. No, 
He could have and should have told her under the tree when he first realized. This behavior just proved he was not trustworthy. Well, I'm sure Mr. Cook will be here soon to grab his things. I doubt he will be staying much longer with us. With that, Emma turned on her heel and hurried into the shared bedroom, shutting the door behind her. She curled up in the bed, thankful that Jenny wasn't in the room, and let the tears flow down her cheeks. Why had God brought this man into her life? Why had he allowed the wound of pain to be refreshed? Would she ever have another chance at love like she had with Joseph? As the tears fell down her cheeks and she mumbled her questions to God, exhaustion descended upon her and her eyes closed. Chapter 8 William William had no idea how long he walked, but the sun was low in the sky when he returned to the homestead. He hoped Emma would have calmed down enough to hear him out, but he couldn't fault her reaction. Carrie and Doc Moore met him at the front door. What did you do to my sister? Carrie asked, hands on her hips and fire shooting from her eyes. William admired her fierce loyalty, but felt for the man who would marry her in the future, as her gaze was penetrating and convicting. I didn't mean to, William said softly. I was trying to find a way to tell her that I was the ranger in charge of the operation that got Joseph killed, but I wasn't fast enough. Carl found out first and told her before I had a chance. Carrie gasped and her hand flew to her mouth. She narrowed her eyes at him and opened her mouth as if she were about to chastise him. Then her mouth closed, and with a shake of her head, she spun on her heel and entered the house, letting the door slam behind her. Doc Moore stared at the closed door for a minute before turning his attention back to William. I'll talk with her later, so why don't you tell me the situation? He pointed to the stools that sat on the porch. William sighed as he sat down. I never thought I'd meet Joseph's widow or the other man's. There was another man killed in the excursion. I never even envisioned this kind of life for myself. I wanted to serve my town and protect the citizens. But when I lost my wife, Catherine, I lost myself as well. I joined the Rangers, which helped for a time, but then I was approached about becoming a hunter. The money called to me, and it was that first job where I recruited rangers, and Joseph answered the call. The roundup went well until one of the men tried to escape. My team went after him, and I thought we had him subdued, but then he managed to pull Joseph's weapon and shot him and two other men before my men knew what was happening. I should have been the one to deliver the news, as I was the one in charge of the men, but I was no longer a ranger. I began collecting bounties full-time after that job. Maybe I was running, not only from Catherine's death, but also from the other men. I don't know. Then I landed here and met Emma. None of this was my intention, though. Well, let's talk about Emma. Doc Moore folded his hands on his lap. He had been quiet during William's story, but William sensed he had issues on his mind. What are your intentions toward my daughter? The question caught William off guard. He thought after his story that Doc Moore would be escorting him off the property, not asking what his intentions were with Emma. To be honest, sir, I'm not sure. I hadn't planned on falling for anyone here, and I'm not sure I could give up hunting outlaws. But your daughter has made quite an impression on me. I find myself thinking of her often, and the guilt from not telling her the whole story ate me up for two days. Doc Moore's brow arched, but he said nothing, letting William flounder through his feelings. I don't know that it matters now, though. She ran off without letting me explain. It's probably for the best that I'm leaving tomorrow. Perhaps it is, Doc Moore said, leaning back, but William felt there was more to his words than he was letting on. If I need to, I can sleep in the barn with the horse tonight, William continued, I don't want to upset Emma any more than I already have. Oh, I think Emma will be all right, Doc Moore said. But I wouldn't be surprised if she stays in her room until she knows you're gone. 
William nodded and followed Doc Moore's lead into the house. Carrie glared at him initially from the kitchen while she prepared dinner, but after a discussion with Doc Moore, her demeanor softened, and she appeared slightly less hostile toward him. William had no idea what the doctor had told her, but he welcomed the reprieve from her scolding eyes. While he helped entertain the younger two with card tricks, his mind wandered to what he would say to Emma when she entered the room. But when supper was ready and Emma still hadn't appeared, he began to accept the fact he might not see her again before leaving. Aren't we waiting for Emma? Benjamin asked as they took their places around the table. Emma isn't feeling well tonight, Doc Moore said, so we are going to let her sleep and not bother her. Does this mean I can't sleep in the room tonight? Jenny asked. We'll sleep in the living room tonight, Carrie said, patting her sister's arm. You can take the couch and I'll take the chair. Okay. Jenny shrugged and scooped up some beans and shoveled them into her mouth. William marveled at her ability to adjust and accept the change without complaint. If only he could be more like her. With the topic of Emma dropped, the rest of dinner was quiet. Before William knew it, the food was gone, and Carrie was picking up the plates to wash them. Do you really have to leave tomorrow? Benjamin asked as they sat around the table after dinner. I do. As William looked at the boy, though, he realized it wasn't just Emma he would miss, but the rest of her family as well. I have to return a bad man to the authorities. Will you come back after that? Benjamin hounded. I don't know, William answered truthfully. My life isn't here. My life is out hunting men who break the law. But what about Emma? Jenny asked, her innocent eyes large and round. Emma will be fine without me, William said, though he was beginning to wonder if he'd be fine without Emma. In fact, she'll probably be better off without me. I doubt that. Carrie's voice was soft as she picked up the last plate from the table, as if she'd meant the words for his ears only. William could have asked her what she meant by that, but it didn't matter. He'd be leaving in the morning, and Emma would be only a memory, which was where she belonged. William woke before the sun, not that he had slept much anyway. He had stayed up hoping Emma would enter the living room so he could talk to her. When that didn't happen, and it became clear the girls wanted to go to sleep, he had retired to the room, but with one ear attuned to the noises in the living room. What little sleep he had received had been restless. With a sigh, William pushed back the blankets and sat up. The pain still throbbed with excessive movement, but it had softened to a dull, manageable ache. He gave it a moment to recede before standing and crossing to his saddlebag. After pulling on his clothes, William folded up the few items he had unpacked and shoved them back in the saddlebag. He spared a final glance around the room to make sure he hadn't missed anything before heading to the kitchen. He didn't expect anyone else was awake, but he was hopeful he could locate the coffee and brew a pot before having to head out. However, he was pleasantly surprised to find Doc Moore reading at the table, Carrie already bustling in the kitchen, and a pot of coffee already made. Good morning, Mr. Cook, Doc Moore said, looking up from his Bible as William entered. Would you like some eggs before you leave? If it isn't too much trouble. William was careful to keep his voice low as Jenny was still asleep on the couch. It's no trouble, Carrie said. There's coffee made, too. Go on and help yourself. William nodded and grabbed a cup off the shelf, feeling very much at home and like an outsider at the same time. He filled the mug, added a dash of milk, and returned to the table with the warm liquid in hand. As he sat down, Carrie placed a plate of eggs, bacon, and a slice of bread in front of him. Thank you. He smiled up at her before picking up his fork. Aren't you going to pray first? Doc Moore asked. William dropped his gaze. It's been quite a while since I prayed. I'm not sure I remember how. Then I'll pray for you, 
the doctor said and closed his eyes. Lord, we thank you for this food and for the hands that prepared it. Thank you for healing William. Keep him safe on his journey and help him find his way back to you. Amen. Amen. William echoed the word, though he felt strange listening to someone else pray for him. He ate his breakfast in silence, unsure how to bring up the topic of Emma. Doc Moore had made it pretty clear the previous night that Emma may want nothing more to do with him, and that he might not see her before leaving. But he felt he at least owed her an apology. Do you have any paper and a pen? William asked when his plate was clean and his belly was full. Doc Moore nodded, walked to a small chest in the living room, and returned a moment later with a few sheets of paper and a pen. William stared at the blank page for a minute, wondering how to write what was in his head. After a deep breath, he placed the pen on the sheet and let the words flow. When he was finished, he folded the letter and wrote Emma's name on the outside. Will you make sure she gets this? William asked Carrie as he stood. Of course, I'll put it in our room where she'll be sure to find it. Carrie took the paper from him and flashed him a small, sympathetic smile. All right, I guess I should be going then, William said. Can you show me where my horse is lodged? Be happy to, Doc Moore said, standing and leading the way outside. The air was crisp and cool as they walked to the barn, and the first rays of sunlight were hitting the sky, creating a brilliant purple and red color. Doc Moore opened the barn door and crossed to the third stall. William was glad to see his horse munching hay happily in the stall. She looked well taken care of. He entered the stall and let Bessie sniff his hand. She had been his first purchase when he joined the rangers, and she had been his closest friend since. Thank you again for boarding her and taking care of her while I recovered. William pulled out a small wad of bills and handed it over to Doc Moore. The doctor shook his head, but William insisted. You fed me, so consider it repayment for food. Besides, I make more than enough money for myself. With a single nod, the doctor accepted the money and shoved it in his pocket. You're welcome, Mr. Cook. Now, if you don't mind, I need to throw my two cents in. I can tell by the way you look at my daughter that you have feelings for her, and the very action of her shutting herself in her room proves she cares for you as well. I know you must turn your bounty in but there comes a time in a man's life when he realizes the chase is no longer what it once was. There is a comfort in coming home to a loyal woman. I know you had that once, Doc Moore continued, when William opened his mouth to speak. And I know you say you don't want it again, but if in you ever do, I'd be willing to get to know you better. Thank you, sir, William said, unsure of what else to say. That very thought had been playing in his head like a record since the day before. How nice it had been to come home to a loving woman, and how it could be that way again if he could give up bounty hunting. But therein lay the quandary. Could he give up the life? The doctor said nothing further as he helped William saddle Bessie up. Be sure to keep your wound clean and covered for another week or so he said, as William mounted Bessie outside the barn. And be seen by a doctor if you have any issues breathing or the pain gets worse. I will, thank you. William spared one final look at the man who had saved his life and then glanced at the house in hopes of at least seeing Emma in the window. Nothing but empty windows greeted him back, and with a sigh, William turned the horse towards town. He had a bounty to collect, and a woman to forget. Chapter 9 Emma The house was quiet when Emma woke the next morning. She looked to the side, but the bed was empty. Where was everyone? Pa would most likely be at work, and Jenny and Benjamin would be at school. But where were Carrie and Samuel? Emma was surprised they had let her sleep in. Of course, usually she was awoken by Jenny first thing in the morning. After a quick stretch, Emma rolled out of bed and dressed for the day. Her calico dress was nothing fancy, 
but it was one of her favorites, as evidenced by the fraying him at the bottom. She opened the bedroom door, expecting to hear Carrie cleaning in the kitchen or see her sitting in the living room sewing, but there was nothing but silence. Hello? Emma called as she walked toward the kitchen. The dishes were washed and drying by the sink, save for a plate with a few pancakes on it, obviously left for her. A wave of hunger knotted her stomach as she realized she had missed dinner the previous night in her effort to avoid William. Grabbing the plate, she sat down at the table, and that's when she saw the note. Her name was at the top, written in her sister's handwriting. Emma, William is gone. I do think you should have listened to his story for Joseph's death wasn't really his fault. We decided to let you sleep as it seemed you needed it, so to make sure it was quiet for you, I decided to help Pa out in the clinic today. Samuel is working in the garden should you need anything. I pray you find peace, and we'll see you this evening. Carrie. Emma frowned at the paper as she cut the pancake into pieces and brought a forkful to her mouth. Had she been wrong not to listen to William? It wouldn't be the first time her emotions got the better of her, but usually she had a way to make it right. If William were gone, though, there was no way to make it right. But maybe it was better this way. After all, even without the lying incident, he wouldn't have stayed, and Emma would still be alone. Wouldn't she? She pondered that question as she finished eating the pancakes. When she was finished, she washed her dishes and then looked around the room for what else she could do. Carrie was such a good homemaker that items were rarely out of place. Emma wandered into the living room, but everything was put away there as well. She would venture into her father and brother's room, but they had often said they would rather she didn't. So she wandered back into the girls' room to grab some knitting. As she reached for the knitting bucket beside the dresser, another flash of white caught her eye. It was another note, but this one wasn't written in her sister's curly script. Instead, her name was spelled out in a crooked print. Intrigued, Emma grabbed the note and sat down on the bed to read it. Dear Emma, I hope Carrie left this for you. I'm sorry things ended so poorly between us, and I wish I could go back and tell you the moment I knew, but I was scared. I haven't felt affection for a woman since Catherine, but I was feeling attraction to you, and I was afraid you would be angry when you found out. I don't know if you felt the same way I did, nor do I know if I could have offered you the kind of life you want. Perhaps it worked out this way for a reason, but I wanted to thank you for caring for my injury and to let you know how sorry I was. If I could go back in time and make sure Gilbert was truly secured and bring Joseph back to you, I would. William Cook Emma fought the emotion as she read the letter again and pored over each word. Had she acted too hastily? It didn't matter now, of course. William was gone, and she had no way to reach him. The enormity of that hit her, and the letter fell from her hands as she curled into a ball and let the tears come once more. William. What took so long? Jack Hardesty asked as William deposited Monroe in his care. This was supposed to be a quick and easy hunt. I took a bullet, William growled. I had to take a few days to heal. I was lucky it hit a fleshy part and didn't cause other damage. He had been grumpy all day since picking Monroe up from the Sage Creek Jail. William had thought once he left the town that the image of Emma would fade from his mind and he would remember the thrill of collecting bounties. But Monroe had been nothing but a hassle since they left. William had bound his hands to the front of the saddle, and then, after getting Monroe mounted on the horse, had tied his feet to the saddle belt to keep him from kicking. Monroe had fought, but not as much as William had expected. Instead, he had pleaded his case the entire ride. William grew so tired of his voice that he almost knocked the man out. I have another mark, Jack said. You think you can handle it, or should I give it to someone else? I can take it, William said. Whether he could or not, he needed to. He needed to stay busy to keep his mind and his heart from wandering to the woman he had left behind. Good, Jack said. 
Well, here's the cut from Monroe and the next mark. He slid a plump white envelope and a folded piece of paper across the desk. William picked up the envelope first and glanced inside to see it bursting with bills. Then he unfolded the piece of paper. A grim-looking man with a long, thin face stared back at him. William scanned the paper. Tom Too Tall Herman was wanted for bank robbery, last seen near Dallas, Texas. It was perfect. Far enough away to put distance between Emma and himself, and with a paycheck of $1,000, it was a nice job that should be challenging enough to keep him on his toes and his mind off a certain woman. Looks good. I'll head out now. Jack nodded and turned his attention to Monroe. After a quick stop at the mercantile to load up and replenish items he needed, William repacked his saddlebag, mounted Bessie, and headed toward Dallas. If he was lucky, he might make it by nightfall, but more than likely he'd be sleeping under the stars. Chapter 10 Emma When her tears were spent, Emma wandered back into the kitchen. She still had a few hours before the young ones would be out of school, and a few more hours until her father and Carrie would be home. Samuel would probably finish his work around the small farm shortly after the young ones returned home. Emma decided to spend the time cooking for supper. She began chopping vegetables for the stew, hoping to keep her mind off William Cook's strong face and cleft chin. When the vegetables were ready, she added them and the meat to a large pot and lit the fire. As the stew began to simmer, she turned her attention to the bread. After the ingredients were mixed, she began kneading the dough, letting her mind flirt with what-if possibilities. If she had heard William out, would he have stayed? Beyond that, if he had stayed, would he have wanted to court her? Might she have one day been preparing bread for him in their house as she waited for him to come home for dinner? Mmm, what smells so good? Jenny's voice broke Emma's daydream, and she looked up to realize nearly an hour had passed and she hadn't gotten the bread in the stove yet. Benjamin and Jenny stood a few feet away staring at her. It's stew, Emma said, placing the bread in the stove. But it's not ready yet. We're going to wait for Pa and Carrie to finish their day before we eat. A small pout graced Jenny's lips. Okay, do you think William will ever come back? Yeah, I miss him too, Benjamin said. I wanted him to teach me about bounty hunting. Oh, I'm sorry, you two, but I don't think Mr. Cook is coming back, Emma said. Emma... Are you sad that William is gone? Jenny asked. Emma sighed. I suppose I am a little, but Mr. Cook had to get back to his life. He would never have been happy staying here. Sage Creek doesn't have enough to offer him. It has us. Jenny folded her arms across her chest. I wanted him to stay. I wanted the two of you to get married so he could be with us always. Why are you so eager to marry me off? Emma flashed a smile, hoping she could change the subject and get the children talking about something other than William. Won't you miss me when I don't live here any longer? Jenny nodded. Of course, but you seemed happier when you were married to Joseph. Emma stared at the sage little girl. Of course she had been happier when she was married to Joseph. But that had been about Joseph and not just about marriage, right? Suddenly, she was no longer sure. William William made it to Dallas just as the sun was setting. At least he'd be able to sleep in a room tonight and ask some questions around town. If he was really lucky, maybe he'd even find his mark hanging around at the saloon, though from his experience, bank robbers tended to be less social. The inn's sign came into view, and William dismounted, throwing the reins around the hitching post before sauntering into the three-story building. The smell of leather greeted him as he stepped into the lobby. Two brown leather couches complemented the cream and brown colors of the room. A woman sat behind a check-in desk to the right. She looked up as William approached 
and he paused. With her blonde hair and hazel eyes, she reminded him very much of Emma. He shook his head to clear the image. How had she affected him so profoundly after only a few days? And continued toward the woman. She wasn't Emma. He knew that. Emma was back in Sage Creek. Can I help you? She asked. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to see if you have a room for a few nights. She smiled at him as she opened a large book. You might be in luck. After a quick scanning, she turned around and grabbed a key off the hook. I have room three available. Wonderful. William plunked down the required bills and took the key. He would check the room out and stash his money before heading to the saloon to gather information. It was never smart to carry a lot of money into those places. You never knew when fights might break out or pickpockets would wander through. A quick investigation of the room satisfied him, and after stashing the money under the bed, William locked the door behind him and headed toward the saloon. The place was bustling when he arrived. Not unusual, as these types of establishments cater to a night crowd. He walked up to the bar and ordered his usual single shot of whiskey. The bartender had just slid the glass in his direction when a heated argument broke out next to him. I told you to stay away from my sister, Charles. The words were slurred and angry. Your sister is old enough to make up her own mind, Leroy. The other man shot back, his words much harder to understand. Both men had clearly had too much to drink. William, wanting to distance himself from any fight so as not to draw attention, grabbed his drink and stood. But the men were quicker than he had expected, and before he had fully turned, a fist appeared out of nowhere and connected with his neck. The room grew gray as William grabbed his neck and sank to the floor. Hot, searing pain erupted in the wound and clawed up his neck. While the men brawled near him, he tried in vain to grab the attention of anyone close by. But everyone's gaze remained fixated on the two men, and William lost his fight with the darkness. Chapter 11 Emma Thank you for coming out with me, Carl said, grabbing Emma's hand. She fought the urge to extricate her hand from his grip as they walked. What had she been thinking? Giving Carl hope wasn't fair to either of them, and she didn't need to be married to be happy. Emma had accepted the invitation to the town picnic in a moment of weakness, and now she was regretting it. You're welcome, but Carl, I hope you understand this doesn't mean we are courting. This is just two friends attending a town social event together. Don't be silly, Emma, he said. You know we belong together, and after this afternoon, I'm sure you'll remember how much fun we used to have. Emma swallowed her sigh. This was going to be a long few hours. The church grounds were already littered with blankets and townspeople when they arrived. Carl found an open patch and spread out a blanket for them. Emma set the picnic basket she had packed down and then folded her feet under her. Would you like some punch? Carl asked. That would be nice, Emma said. He returned a few minutes later, with a cup of lemonade for them both. After handing her a cup, he sat as well, placing himself a little too close to Emma for her comfort. Are you hungry? she asked, shifting her position to discreetly put more space between them. She opened the picnic basket. I have cheese, biscuits, and fruit. Do you remember the first barn dance we attended? he asked, ignoring her question and scooting closer again. Emma knew he was referring to the dance where they had cuddled in the haystack before being found by Samuel. She had thought then she was going to marry Carl, not necessarily because she loved him, but because he was nice to her and they got along. The concept wasn't romantic, but practical marriages were the way of the West, and in a practical concept, they had made sense. Yes, Carl, I remember, but that was a long time ago. Emma pulled out the cheese and fruit and placed it on a plate in front of them. It doesn't have to be, 
he said, leaning toward her. We could share those feelings again. I'm sorry, Carl. This was a mistake. Emma dropped the piece of cheese she had picked up and stood. I thought we could revisit being friends, but it appears we have two different views of our relationship. Emma, wait, Carl said, pushing himself up and reaching out to her. No, Carl, I need time to think. I'll see you later. Before he could protest any further, Emma spun around and hurried home. William When William awoke, his throat felt funny. Stiff and sore, but also cold. The cot he was on was hard, though covered in a sheet, and the room felt sterile. A hospital? The memory of the bar fight flooded back. He was beginning to have very bad luck in saloons. William raised his hand to touch his neck, but before his hand reached the skin, a woman entered the room. Don't touch, she scolded. It hasn't had time to heal yet. William opened his mouth to speak, but his vocal cords did not seem to be working. You can't speak, the woman said, coming closer. Due to some bullet fragments shifting in your neck, your windpipe closed. The doctor was forced to perform a tracheotomy. William's eyes grew round. Though not sure exactly what that meant, it didn't sound good. He was able to retrieve all the fragments, and your neck should heal soon so we can remove the tube. The procedure heals quickly after that, but you'll have to be careful to avoid injuring your neck in the future. The door opened again, and a man entered. Oh, good, you're awake. Has Nurse Johnson informed you of your condition? William nodded, knowing trying to speak would be useless. Good, let me check the tube to see if we can take it out yet. As the doctor came closer, William wondered how long he had been out. Would his mark even still be in town, or would he be long gone by now? Did he even still care? If his neck wound did require him to stop bounty hunting, it would be the perfect excuse to retire, and he couldn't think of any place he'd rather do that than Sage Creek. All right, the wound is healing nicely. I'm going to remove the tube and we'll let the wound close. You'll probably need to stay while it's healing, but once it's closed over, you should be free to go. William nodded and closed his eyes as the doctor prepared for the procedure. Chapter 12 Emma How long are you going to hide from him? Carrie asked Emma as they rolled out dough to make cookies. It was Saturday afternoon, a time when the girls tried to bake and talk, though usually Jenny was scurrying around their feet as they did. Today, she had gone with Pa and the boys into town to pick up a few things. I don't know what you're talking about, Emma said, averting her gaze and pretending to focus on the rolling pin. Yes, you do. It's been nearly a week since you went to the picnic with Carl and you've barely left the house since. Emma sighed. He was a great friend once, but now he's obsessed with marrying me and I just can't do it. Because of William? Carrie teased with a knowing smile. It's stupid, right? Emma asked. I ran him off by not listening to him, and now I can't stop thinking about him. I tell myself it would never work, but I can't deny the attraction was there. Maybe not quite the same as Joseph, but close, and I never thought I would find that again. A look of sympathy covered Carrie's face. Maybe he'll come back, she offered half-heartedly. I know he cared about you. Emma shook her head and rolled her eyes. No, my impetuousness has finally caught up to me. I need to get used to the fact that he's really gone and move on. But I can't marry Carl just to marry someone. I'll just have to hope that God forgives my wasting of this opportunity and grants me another. Before Carrie could reply, a knock sounded at the front door. The girls shared a look of confusion and trepidation. With the rest of the family in town, it was only the two of them in the house. While patients did come to the house on occasion, it didn't happen often. 
I'll get the rifle, Emma said. Why don't you go hide in our room? Though fear shone in Carrie's green eyes, she shook her head resolutely. No, if you're going to answer the door, then I'm coming too. All right, Emma nodded, leading the way to the front door where the rifle was kept. The rapping came again as she grabbed the gun and checked to make sure it was loaded. Carrie, on my count, open the door, Emma said, bracing the gun against her shoulder as Samuel had taught her. Now! Carrie swung the door open and towards her, using it almost like a shield between her and the person on the other side. William? Emma's voice was breathless with disbelief, and she blinked her eyes a few times to make sure she wasn't dreaming. Hi, Emma, he said as a crooked smile graced his lips. Thanks for not shooting me, but are you going to make me stand out here all day? Or are you going to invite me in? His voice sounded different, a little scratchier, and the bandage around his neck didn't look like the ones her father used, but it was William all the same. Still not trusting her eyes, Emma eased the hammer back down and nodded. Of course, come in. She lowered the gun and leaned it against the wall. Hi, Carrie. William said as he stepped over the threshold and closed the door behind him. A moment of awkward silence fell as the girls looked at William and waited for an explanation. He cleared his throat and shoved his hands in his pockets. If Emma hadn't known better, she would have sworn William was nervous, but she had never seen him nervous. Did bounty hunters even feel nervous? William William stared at his boots as he gathered his courage. Emma hadn't kicked him out already, so that was a good sign. Maybe Carrie or one of the other family members had told her his side of the story. Still, just because she was being civil didn't mean she felt as he did, and that was the scary part. What if he had ridden all the way out here to confess his feelings, only to find out she was no longer interested? What would he do then? I suppose you're wondering why I'm here, he said slowly, as he raised his eyes to meet Emma's. The thought had crossed my mind. She gave him a small smile. That smile bolstered his courage, and William took a step in her direction. I came back for you, Emma. I know we didn't leave on good terms, and I thought I could forget you. But the whole time I was bringing Monroe in, you were all I could think of. I don't know how you got in my head, Emma Stewart, but I can't seem to get you out. Oh, Carrie sighed, grabbing both Emma's and William's attention. That's so romantic. Out, Emma said to Carrie, pointing to the kitchen before grabbing William's arm and leading him to the living room. She sat on the couch and motioned for him to sit beside her, which William did willingly. He longed to reach out and take her hand, but he restrained himself. I can't believe you came back. Her eyes were focused on her lap, and her voice was barely more than a whisper. I thought I was justified in my anger at you, but even before Carrie told me the whole story, I began to regret pushing you away. Of course, by the time I swallowed my pride, you were already gone. Her eyes flicked up to his. I honestly never thought I'd see you again. It was the invitation he needed. He could see her heart in her jade eyes, and he reached for her hand, enjoying the delicate feel of her skin against his. I wasn't sure I would ever see you again either, he said, but as I lay in the hospital bed healing this week, I found that I didn't care about the money or the adrenaline any longer. I only cared about you. Emma's eyes widened, and her gaze shifted to the bandage around his neck. Did you re-injure it? His lips pulled into a tight smile. He had to tell her, but he hoped the truth wouldn't scare her away. I didn't get out of the way fast enough when a fight broke out in a saloon. The punch shifted some bullet fragments and cut off my air supply. They were forced to do a tracheotomy until I could breathe again but they think they got all the pieces this time. I'll always have a scar, Emma, 
and I don't know that there won't be complications later. I know I'm not offering you much, but I'm offering you all I have. Tears shimmered in Emma's eyes as she shook her head. You stupid man. I don't care about a scar or complications. My father is a doctor, remember? I'm just glad you're okay. William wiped a tear from her eye and let his hand linger on her cheek. She sighed and leaned against it for a moment before jerking up. I can't leave Sage Creek, though, William. I'm not the kind of woman who would enjoy the life of a bounty hunter. I guess it's a good thing I gave it up then, he said with a smile. And then, even though he knew he probably shouldn't, William leaned forward and touched Emma's lips with his own. It was only a moment, but it was enough to solidify any lingering doubts he had. This woman was his future. Chapter 13 Emma Emma ran the brush through her long blonde hair one last time as she regarded her image in the mirror. If you don't stop brushing it, it may all fall out, Carrie teased from across the room. Jenny's eyes grew wide. Can that happen? No, of course not, Emma answered with a laugh. Carrie is just teasing me. I wouldn't have to if you would stop preening in front of that mirror. You look lovely. Emma glanced down at her dark green velvet dress. The neckline was wide and showed off her slender shoulders, and the color complemented her eyes. It wasn't a new dress, but it was one William hadn't seen yet, and she hoped he would enjoy it. I just want it to be perfect. Emma ran her hand down the dress to smooth out any wrinkles. It's our first dance together. And it won't be the last. Carrie crossed to the mirror to check her own reflection. I bet William proposes to you any day now. Emma couldn't help but smile at the thought. The signs were all pointing that direction. He had begun building a homestead near her father's house, as she had told him this side of town was her favorite. At this point, he didn't have to work as he had saved most of his money from his bounties and had plenty to finish the house and live comfortably until he decided what he wanted to do next. I hope so, Emma said. I'm so glad everyone appears to have accepted him into the fold again. Well, everyone except Carl, Carrie joked. Emma's face fell as she thought of Carl. He was the one hitch in her happiness. Ever since William had returned and they had begun attending town functions together, Carl had become stoic and reclusive. Emma hadn't wanted to hurt him, and she truly hoped he would find a woman who could appreciate him soon. But she also had to do what was right for her. Can we go now? Jenny asked, breaking the somber mood that had fallen on Emma. Yes, Ginny Bean, let's get out of here. Emma grabbed the little girl's hand and pulled her out of the room. William William sucked in his breath as Emma entered the living room. Her eyes sparkled as she smiled at Jenny beside her, and the green of her dress was breathtaking. He couldn't believe she was actually his. You look beautiful, he said as he took a step toward her. Why, thank you, William. She flashed him her special flirtatious smile. The rest of the family filed into the room, and after checking to make sure all needed items were accounted for, they exited the house and began the short walk to the barn. Lighted lanterns hung from the open doors, creating a soft romantic glow. William couldn't have been happier. This would be the perfect setting for the question he wanted to ask Emma. As soon as they were inside, Jenny and Benjamin raced to the back to begin sampling the food. Doc Moore wandered over to some of the other men, and Samuel and Carrie split off to find their friends. Shall we dance? William asked, as he led Emma toward the dance floor. I'd love nothing more, she answered. As his arms circled her, William thought again how perfect a fit she was in them. 
He had never expected to fall in love with another woman after Catherine, but as he twirled the beautiful blonde woman around, he knew he had done just that. Yet he wasn't scared. In fact, he was exhilarated. The thought of a life with her filled him with excitement each day. You're not a bad dancer, Emma said, teasing him. I'm actually a very good dancer, he responded. It just takes me a minute to warm up. By the end of the night, I expect to be amazed then. He tightened his grip on her and pulled her close. I'm amazed every day I spend with you, he whispered down to her. A rosy pink color flooded her cheeks and she shook her head. Flattery will get you nowhere, Mr. Cook. Well then, how about this? Though the music played on, he stopped moving and dropped to one knee. Emma Stewart, you have reopened my heart to God and to love, and for that I am truly thankful. Will you do me the honor of being my wife? A silence fell as the crowd around them realized what was happening. Even the music stopped. Emma glanced around before returning her gaze to him. Of course I'll marry you, William. Clapping and cheers erupted around them, but William barely heard them. He stood, scooping the woman he loved up and twirled her around. Though he had not thought it possible, he had finally found his way home. Chapter 14 Emma You're so lucky, Carrie sighed as she brushed her long hair as the girls got ready for bed that night. That proposal was so romantic. I'm sure yours will come soon. Emma smiled at her younger sister as she took her own hair down. I saw you dancing with Philip Alder, and he had stars in his eyes. What about me? Jenny asked. Emma laughed and tussled her youngest sister's brown hair. You have a few years yet, Jenny Bean, but there's a man out there for you as well. You just have to be patient. Jenny's lower lip fell out in an adorable pout. I want to be older now. I want to be kissed like you were, Emma. It looked so romantic. She put her little hand on her forehead and fell onto the bed. Oh dear, we have our work cut out for us with this one. Emma slipped her dress off and her nightgown on and climbed into bed beside six-year-old Jenny. Carrie followed suit and climbed in on the other side of Jenny. Have you thought about the wedding yet? Carrie asked. He only proposed tonight. Emma's tone was dismissive as if she had thought of no such thing. The truth was, she had already been thinking about the wedding. She wanted it in the church, of course. Carrie would be a bridesmaid and Jenny the flower girl. Emma wondered if William would ask Samuel, her brother, to be his best man. The two had been spending a lot of time together building William's homestead, but there was also Jesse Jennings, who William had become close with. Emma had also become good friends with Kate Jennings. The two were close in age and became friends when William began courting Emma. Once to twice a week, they would get together and trade secrets and recipes. They also spoke often of their desire to have children. Kate would reach that milestone first. She was already with child and nearing her fifth month. Though Emma enjoyed seeing her friend grow, she couldn't help feeling jealous, and so she hoped William would be okay with a fairly short engagement. She wanted to start a family with him. I know he just proposed tonight, Carrie continued, but I bet you've been thinking about the wedding since the first day he kissed you. Emma was glad the light from the lantern was low so her sisters wouldn't see her blush. She had been thinking about the wedding since that day. Well, not the wedding itself, but the marriage. She had already had one wedding, having been married to Joseph Stewart before a Texas Ranger mission cut his life short. So even though weddings were enjoyable and beautiful, that wasn't her focus. Her focus was on being a wife and mother, something she had hoped for with her first marriage but it had ended so quickly it was almost non-existent. 
As much as Emma loved her family, she wanted to be a wife again, to run her own homestead, cook for her husband, and enjoy quiet times in front of the fire. And eventually, she hoped to fill the house with children. But that was at least a year away. Get some sleep, Emma said in answer. We can talk more about the wedding tomorrow. Do I get to throw the flowers again? Jenny's voice was heavy with sleep. Yes, Jenny Bean, you can throw the flowers. Now go to sleep. Carrie and Jenny obliged and soon were breathing softly beside her. But it was Emma's own mind that refused to shut down. When it wasn't reliving the wonderful night and the proposal, it was thinking forward to what had to be done for a wedding. She would need to make the cake, get flowers, and see if she could alter her old wedding dress a little. Emma couldn't afford a new one, and it would have been a frivolous waste of money anyway. William William left Emma's house after walking the girls home with a smile on his lips. Though he had been nearly certain she would say yes, there was always the small chance of a negative reply. However, with the positive response, he could now relax and focus all his energy on finishing the homestead. It was nearly complete as he had spent the last few months on it, but he needed to finish daubing and acquire the rest of the furniture. That would require a trip into a larger town, though. Sage Creek was growing, and he could get tables and chairs there, but he wanted at least one special piece for Emma. Perhaps he could do that in the next few days. You're a hard man to track down. William stiffened at the sound of the voice and reached for his gun. Retired or not, he still liked having it attached to his side and rarely went anywhere without it. Easy now, the voice said, and a moment later William relaxed as the man stepped out of the shadows. Though it had been a while, William would have recognized that mustache anywhere. What are you doing here, Jack? I'm retired. William walked past the man who had convinced him to become a bounty hunter and up the few steps to his porch. Yeah, I heard that. Didn't really believe it, though. Wild Bill Cook no longer hunting? It doesn't seem right. Well, it is. I've been out of the game for months. This is my life now. William motioned to the house. Are you really ready to settle down? I settled down once before, if you remember. William leaned against the side of the house and crossed his arms. Jack's fingers traced his mustache. That's right. You were married before. What was her name? Catherine. After her death, I wasn't sure I would ever marry again. But I love Emma, and I am ready. William's eyes dropped to the porch and he sighed. Even if I weren't, this here keeps me from getting back into bounty collecting. He pointed to the scar on his neck. Got wounded on the bounty that landed me here. Emma nursed me back to health, but I wasn't ready to settle down. Took another job, but landed in the wrong place at the wrong time and took a punch to the neck. The bullet fragments shifted, and I ended up having to have a tracheotomy. The doctors in Dallas told me I should give up the hunting life. So I'll ask you again, Jack. What are you doing here? It's Holden. William froze at the mention of the name. John Holden, his first job as a bounty hunter and the job that had gotten Emma's late husband, Joseph, killed. What about him? Can we talk inside? Jack motioned to the front door. William debated for a moment before nodding. He led the way through the mostly empty living room into the kitchen area, where the table and chairs he had recently finished sat. He pointed to one and pulled out a second one for himself. So what about Holden? Jack took a deep breath and ran his right hand over his mustache again and down his chin. After we picked up Holden, he was being held in the Dallas jail until his trial. About a week ago, he managed to disarm a guard and escape. The thought turned William's stomach over. John Holden had been notoriously evil before he was arrested, and having him out again was an unsettling thought. But it was no longer William's fight. I'm sorry to hear that, but you have great men. I'm sure you'll be able to capture him again. 
There's more, Bill. It's William now. Jack nodded and then dropped his eyes to the tabletop. His index finger tapped a few times on the wood, and William bit the inside of his lip to keep from snapping at the man to spit it out. You remember how connected he was? Jack raised his eyes to meet William's once again. Yes, I remember. We got word he's gotten a few highly trained and ruthless men together and wants revenge on those who put him in prison. William stiffened. He didn't want Holden anywhere near this town, Emma or her family. The worst part is that he appears to be going after the men's families. Most of us don't have many left, but... Mabel? William hadn't spoken the name in years, but she was his only family outside of Emma. Jack looked up. Who? My half-sister. William blinked away the old memories as they began to invade. We haven't spoken in years. How would Holden even know about her? He might not. Jack sighed and tapped the tabletop. But William, you know how dangerous he is. Holden, at least from what I gather from witnesses it was Holden, went after my brother. James was shot at the saloon two days ago. He didn't make it. I didn't know about your sister, but I came out here to warn you and to ask you to join me. My brother lived in Roseville, so we've dispatched the rangers there. They'll spread out from Roseville and update the local sheriffs. I've also rounded up as many bounty hunters as I can to track him, but I want to find him first, and I want you with me. Not only are you a great shot, but your sister could be in danger. William closed his eyes as he processed the information. Roseville wasn't far from Barefoot Glen, where he had grown up. Mabel probably still lived there, though he hadn't spoken with her since their mother died. However, if Holden were seeking revenge, he might go to Barefoot Glen in search of William, which would put everyone in his hometown in danger, including Mabel. Emma wouldn't want him to go, though. In fact, if he were honest, he felt a small sliver of fear at the thought of going. What if he didn't make it back to Emma? Or what if he received an injury that would cost him his throat and his voice? Would Emma still want to marry a man who couldn't speak, who would be unable to tell her how beautiful she was? But it was Mabel, and while they hadn't been close, she was still his sister. And what if Holden didn't stop there? If Hardesty found him, Holden could too, and then Emma and her family would be in danger as well. Please, William, he was my brother. William opened his eyes. I need to talk with Emma. I understand. Jack issued a curt nod. I'll be heading out tomorrow by noon. I can't lose him. Does that give you enough time? No, it didn't give him enough time. He needed another few weeks to finish the house. He wanted to marry Emma first to start a family, but he couldn't say those things aloud. I guess it will have to. And why don't you stay here tonight? I've only got the one bed right now, but I have plenty of blankets. Thank you. Jack pushed his hat back a little on his head. That's mighty nice of you. William nodded, pushed back his chair, and led the way to the bedrooms. The house had three. One for Emma and himself, and two for the children he hoped to have one day. As he set Jack up in one room, he couldn't help wondering if his decision would keep that from ever happening. After readying for bed, William sank to his knees and looked up. Lord, please show me the right decision. I don't want to leave Emma, but I can't let Holden kill any more families. With his peace said, William closed his eyes and tried to quiet his spirit so he could hear God's answer. Chapter 15 Emma Emma was just finishing making breakfast when a knock sounded at the door. Her eyes shot to her father, who held up his hand, motioning her to wait as he pushed back from the table and crossed to the front window. It's just William. Doc Moore let the curtain fall back into place. He opened the door and stepped back, letting William step inside. Good morning, William. What can we do for you this morning? William's eyes focused on the floor for a moment before lifting to find Emma's. Before he had even said a word, Emma sensed something was wrong. 
Her hands clenched tightly together in her lap, and her bottom lip folded under as she waited for the bad news. Shall I leave you two alone? Doc Moore asked as he looked from William to Emma. Actually, sir, I'd like you to stay. This concerns you as well. William stepped into the kitchen, followed by Doc Moore and sat at the table. Emma, do you remember John Holden? Emma sucked in her breath. She would never forget that name. It was the mission to capture him that got her Joseph killed. She nodded, at a loss for words. I got a visit from Jack Hardesty last night, the man who convinced me to become a bounty hunter. He said Holden escaped from jail and is on the run. Is he coming here? Emma wasn't sure how Holden would know William was in Sage Creek, but it was the only conclusion she could reach that would explain William's serious expression. I can't say for sure, but Jack said he appears to be targeting the men's families. I'd like to think you are safe because Joseph died on the mission and wasn't really responsible for bringing him in. Emma flinched and shifted her eyes. She loved William, but being reminded of Joseph's death still stung. William's voice softened as he continued. What I mean is, while Joseph was involved, his death kept his name out of the papers that sensationalized the story after we got Holden. So I don't think Holden knows about you, but he knows about me. He's already killed Hardesty's brother and... William paused. I need to check on and warn my sister. Emma's eyes shot back to William. You have a sister? This was news to her. William had never mentioned a sister. He nodded and took another deep breath. She's a half-sister from my mother's first marriage. We're not close, as she was seven when our mother married my father, and eight when I was born. She resented the time mother spent with me and felt I stole her mother from her. Our relationship was always rocky, but when mother died, Mabel never spoke to me again. William, I'm so sorry. Emma forced her hands to separate and reached across the table to grab one of William's hands. But if you don't talk anymore, how would Holden know about her? I'm not sure he does, but Barefoot Glen, where I'm from, isn't that big. If Holden shows up there looking for me, people might point him in Mabel's direction. We're not close, but she's all that's left of my family. Hardesty thinks we can catch him, and I have to go. Emma's hand flew to her mouth as her eyes widened. No, you can't, William. I already lost Joseph to Holden. I can't lose you, too. Plus, didn't the doctor say another injury could damage your throat for good? Doc Moore spoke up. They did, and I didn't come to this decision lightly. William held Doc Moore's gaze before returning his eyes to Emma. But I feel like this is God's will. If Holden could find Hardesty's brother, and Hardesty found me, then it's only a matter of time before Holden would come here. I can't let that happen. And there's a chance to stop him now. A good one. The Texas Rangers have headed up north to try to cut him off, and Hardesty has hired as many bounty hunters as he can. If we leave today, we can get there by nightfall. Then why do they need you? It sounds like they have plenty of men. Emma sounded desperate, and she hated it, but she couldn't lose another man she loved. God had graced her with a second chance at a marriage based on love, which Emma knew didn't happen often. William sighed and ran his hand across his chin. He's after our families. I can't stay here and let the other men deal with that. I have to go. It's my duty. White hot anger flooded Emma. Oh, I am so sick of you men and your duty. She pushed back her chair and slapped her hands on the table. Duty gets you killed. You were supposed to give up this life, to stay here with me. We're supposed to be getting married. Now I find out you've been keeping secrets from me and you have a sister? I'm sorry I didn't tell you about my sister. I honestly never thought she'd be in my life again and I will do my best to come back to you. William stood and crossed to her. He reached for her hand, but Emma snatched it away. 
Your best should be staying here with me because you can't assure me you'll make it back. With that, Emma fled the room. Her sisters still slept, so she pushed open the front door and ran to the barn where she flung herself down on a bale of hay. Her head dropped onto her arms and her shoulders heaved as the tears came. Why, God, she sobbed, why does every man I love keep leaving? William. William turned to follow Emma, but Doc Moore stayed his arm. Let her go. She needs time to process. I understand your position, William, Doc Moore continued. It's hard, but I think you're doing the right thing. You'd never forgive yourself if something happened to your sister, even if you aren't close. William sighed and nodded. And thank you for warning us about Holden. I'll make sure Samuel is extra vigilant until you return and can assure us Holden is taken care of. And I know you'll come home. Let's pray for your safety. William closed his eyes and felt Doc Moore's hand upon his shoulder. Lord, we ask your protection for William. He is an important part of our family, and though we understand he is following your will in taking this job, we ask that you bring him home safely to us. Amen. Amen, William echoed. Thank you, sir, for the prayer and for understanding. I really will do everything in my power to come back to her. I know you will, son. I know you will. William shook Doc Moore's hand, hoping it wouldn't be the last time, and left the house. As he mounted his horse, his eyes scanned the area, but there was no sign of Emma. His gaze traveled to the barn. She had to be in there, or else he would have spotted her. The view was fairly flat from here. He fought the urge to go in and kiss her goodbye. William wanted to take a memory with him, but he chose to respect Doc Moore's words instead. With a final farewell glance, he turned the horse toward his homestead. Jack Hardesty was packing his saddlebags as William arrived. How did it go? He asked as William dismounted and tied the reins to the porch. About as I expected, not as good as I hoped. I'll have to make it up to Emma when I get back, he said. If I get back. If good fortune is with us, hopefully we can have this wrapped up in a week and have you back with your betrothed. Jack cinched his saddle and checked the fit. William nodded, but they needed more than good fortune. They needed God on their side. Let me grab a few things and I'll be ready to go. After a quick trip into the house to grab his Bible and a handkerchief Emma had given him a few weeks earlier, the men mounted up and headed north. The ride was quiet, but William appreciated the silence as it gave him time to pray. Chapter 16 Emma What is going on with you today? Kate asked as the women worked on their knitting. William left this morning. Emma tried to control the tears that threatened to spill down her cheeks. What? Kate's needles stopped mid-click. Why? An old outlaw from his past escaped and is seeking revenge on those who put him in prison. William is worried he'll go after his sister. William has a sister? Emma nodded. I can't believe he never mentioned her before. How can you forget to mention a sister? I felt so blindsided this morning when he told me. She sniffed and wiped the wetness from the corner of her eye. What reason did he give? He said they had a rocky relationship and hadn't spoken in years. But then why does he feel the need to endanger himself to protect her? Kate resumed her knitting, but her furrowed brow showed her concern. Maybe it's not so much about her. What do you mean? A small sigh escaped Kate's lips, and she placed her needles down. Remember when I told you about my trip here, how my stagecoach was robbed? Emma nodded and laid her knitting down as well. Well, as you know, Bill Easterly, the man I came to marry, was one of the bandits. They found another man dead in Easterly's home when I led Jesse out there. 
Then Jesse killed Easterly himself when he tried to kidnap me at the dance, and the sheriff killed the last man when he came after Jesse and me. I tell myself that's the end, but those men may have had other family members that might want revenge. She touched her belly. I worry about that constantly, especially with this little one on the way, and I know that even though he loves me, Jesse wishes he too could be sure the danger was over. So maybe it's something like that. Emma pursed her lips as she pondered the words. William said he feared Holden would come after her if he didn't stop him. And would Emma still have respected William if he hadn't gone to protect his sister? You're right. I've been so silly. I didn't even say goodbye to him. When will I stop being so rash and prideful? Kate reached over and laid a hand on Emma's arm. It will be okay. We all have areas we struggle in. Just continue giving it to God and he will work on your heart. As for William, we will pray daily for his safe return. Tears filled Emma's eyes again, and this time she didn't bother to stop them. She let them fall in little rivulets down her cheek, one after the other. They were tears for her own pride and tears for the sadness she must have placed on William when she didn't say goodbye. But mainly, they were tears of fear. Fear that he might not come home, and that if he didn't, her last words to him would be words of anger. Her mother had always warned to never part in anger, as one never knew when it might be the last time they saw someone. After her mother's death, those words should have been emblazoned on Emma's soul, but once again she had let her emotion get the best of her. Look, why don't we do something special for William? Kate handed Emma a handkerchief to dry her tears. Emma wiped at her cheeks, but she didn't trust her voice enough to speak, so she simply turned questioning eyes on Kate. Jesse's been helping William at the homestead, and he said it needs a woman's touch. Why don't we do that while he's gone? We could get some of the other women together, including Carrie, and we could work on the quilt for the bed. Kate smiled at her friend and sniffed away the remaining tears. That would be wonderful, Kate. Good, I'll spread the word today and we can start tomorrow. We'll meet here and we'll quilt and chat every day until William returns. Though Emma knew they probably wouldn't meet every day, she appreciated Kate's optimism. She was very lucky to have found such a good friend. William it was nightfall when Jack pulled his horse to a stop and turned to William. Let's camp here for the night. We have another few hours, but I don't like riding in the dark. William nodded and dismounted his own horse. He wasn't a fan of riding in the dark either. Though it was often cooler, it made it much harder to see anyone who might lay in wait to rob passerby. With Holden on the loose, it was even more dangerous. He tied his horse up to a nearby tree and pulled his blanket and some food out of his saddlebags. After rolling out his blanket, he helped Jack gather wood for a fire. When the flame blazed brightly, the men sat on their respective blankets. William unwrapped his bread, which had retained most of its softness. As he took a bite of the bread, he glanced over at Jack, who was unwrapping his own food. I'm sorry about your brother. Jack's hand stopped just short of his mouth, and his eyes shifted to the right. Me too. I didn't even think to warn him when the Dallas jail contacted me about bringing Holden back in. They said he had been talking up going after the men who brought him in, but I never thought he'd go after our families. Has he gone after others? Jack's lips pursed, and he looked away. Robert Lewis. He was the one who shot more, if you remember. Holden found his family while Lewis was out on a mission. It wasn't pretty, and Lewis killed himself when he returned. That's awful. William clenched his jaw as he remembered his own feelings when he saw Catherine killed in front of him. It is, and that's why we have to stop him. I don't want to lose any more men or their families. William nodded. He didn't want to lose any more men either. 
Though he was no longer leading them, he had been the one to recruit them for that mission. And just like Joseph's death, they weighed on his soul. What if he's not in Barefoot Glen? Then we wait him out. I don't know if there's an order to his madness, or if it's been more about location and proximity. But either way, it's a good bet Barefoot Glen will be one of his next targets. If it's just about location, Barefoot Glen is near Roseville, which makes it a perfect target. If there's an order to his attacks, then it makes sense after myself and Lewis, you would be high on the list. Not only did you lead the men who took down more, but they splashed your name all over the papers. Not that I wanted that. William rolled his eyes. Being in the papers had not been part of the plan. A low chuckle escaped Jack's mouth. We never do. Makes our job that much harder. But Wild Bill Cook was famous, so there was no way they would leave your name out. I didn't ask for that either. William had never taken to the nickname. Someone had given it to him as a ranger because of his fearless attitude towards riding into danger. In truth, he hadn't been fearless. He had been challenging death. Death had already stolen Catherine, and William had felt he had nothing more to live for. Then he'd met Emma, and that had all changed. We rarely do. Jack dusted his hands on his pants after he finished his food. We should get some rest, but I'd suggest withholding on the loose that we keep watch. Why don't you sleep first and I'll take first watch? William finished the last of his bread and lay back on his blanket. He pulled his hat over his eyes and tried not to think about riding into Barefoot Glen in the morning. The town held too many conflicting memories for him. On one hand, he had grown up there, but it was also where his parents had died. Then he had met Catherine, but she too had died in the town. So much happiness and so much sadness resided in such a small town, and tomorrow he would have to face it all. Chapter 17 Emma Why can't I come? Jenny whined as the girls got dressed. Because you have school, Carrie said. Besides, we will be quilting, Emma added. I doubt you would have much fun. Jenny pouted and crossed her arms. I never get to do anything fun. It's always just school, school, school. Emma smiled as she bit back her laugh. Sometimes Jenny sounded like such an old soul. Come on, breakfast is waiting for us at the table. Carrie and Jenny followed her to the table where their father, Samuel, and Benjamin already sat. Doc Moore had his Bible open and was reading from the book of Psalms. Samuel appeared to be listening intently, but Benjamin's eyes kept glancing at the pancakes on the table. His hands were clasped tightly in his lap, probably to keep himself from grabbing the delicious golden circles. Ah, the girls have arrived, Doc Moore said when he saw them. Benjamin has been waiting patiently. Or not so patiently, Samuel said with a smirk. Benjamin stuck out his tongue at his older brother as the girls took their seats around the table. Can we pray for William's safety? Emma's eyes sought her father's as the family grabbed hands. Of course, Doc Moore agreed. We will pray daily for his safety. Around the table, heads bowed, and Doc Moore led them in prayer. When the last amen was uttered, the food flowed. They passed pancakes from one to the next, followed by the butter and some homemade jam. When the food disappeared, Emma and Carrie gathered the dishes and washed them quickly in the sink, placing them out to dry before gathering their quilting supplies. Jenny and Benjamin waited on the couch with their school pails on their laps ready to go. All right, let's go. Emma opened the door and stepped onto the porch. Her siblings, all but Samuel, who was staying to work the farm, followed her out, and they began their trek to school. After dropping the younger two children off, Carrie and Emma continued to Kate's house. There were already a few other women in attendance, including Rebecca Johnson and Sarah Miller, whose parents owned the cafe. 
Emma and Carrie sat in empty chairs near Kate and began unloading their quilting supplies. I'm sorry to hear about William, Sarah said. Thank you. Emma pulled out a few of her favorite fabric pieces. I'm just praying for his safety and hoping after this mission no other one calls him away. I love him, but I don't want to marry a bounty hunter who is always away. Just because he stays here doesn't mean bad things won't happen to him, Rebecca mumbled. Emma understood she was referring to her late best friend, Pauline, who had been killed by outlaws during a bank robbery. That is true, but at least the chances are smaller if he isn't out chasing the bad guys. A silence fell on the group. Kate cleared her throat and caught Emma's eyes. What colors are you hoping to have in the house? Emma sensed her friend was changing the subject, hoping to lighten the somber mood. Oh, I have thought little about it. She paused and pictured her perfect house. I guess light blue and beige. Ooh, I have a great fabric that matches that. Rebecca dug in her fabric bag for a minute and pulled out a large cotton square, checkered with a light blue pattern. That is lovely, Emma agreed. And wouldn't it look great next to this one? Carrie produced a beige square with little flowers on it. With the topic of death forgotten, the women excitedly displayed their fabric squares and placed them together. Emma smiled as the pattern unfolded. William was sure to love it, if he made it home. William Jack stirred as the sun filtered through the trees. Why did you let me sleep so long? He shot William a narrowed glare as he sat up and stretched. William smiled as he packed up his blanket. Well, first, it's not that late. Nine or ten, judging by the position of the sun. Second, I've done this enough times to know I'd rather have a well-rested man watching my back than a tired one. But we're racing against time here, William. We don't have the luxury of sleep. Jack quickly rolled up his blanket, tied it to the back of his saddle, and mounted his horse. With a shake of his head, William followed suit, and the men continued towards Barefoot Glen. William's heart tightened as they rode into town. It looked as he remembered and he fought to keep the memory of Catherine's murder from resurfacing. Do you know where your sister lives? Jack asked. William shook his head and swallowed his emotion. Not exactly. I heard she moved outside of town when she married, but I never knew exactly where. We can check in at the sheriff's office. If my old boss still oversees the town, he might have an idea. Sounds like a plan. Jack motioned ahead of him. Lead the way. William closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Please, God, give me the strength to be in this town again. When he felt the peace descend, William opened his eyes and led the way to the sheriff's office, which was a small building nestled between the cafe and the post office. After dismounting, William secured the reins of his horse to the hitching post and led the way into the office. An older man with white hair and a matching mustache stood as they entered. Bill? Bill Cook? Hey, Clarence. William removed his hat and nodded at his old boss. I go by William now. This here is my friend Jack. Nice to meet you, Jack. Clarence stepped forward and extended a weathered, leathery hand. He was older and seemed a little more relaxed than William remembered. Same to you. Jack returned the friendly gesture, but his tone was all business. Well, William, what can I do for you? I didn't think I'd be seeing you again after, you know. William nodded and cleared his throat to remove the ball of emotion blocking it. Yes, I'm afraid we are here on business. Do you know where Mabel is living? Mabel, your sister, but I thought you weren't on speaking terms. Though generally a private family matter, William had been close enough to Clarence when he worked for him to have filled him in on the rocky family situation. We aren't, but she might be in danger. Danger? What do you mean? Clarence's laid-back attitude disappeared, and he squared his shoulders, reminding William of the man he used to work for. 
John Holden escaped and is seeking revenge on the men who put him away, Jack said, but he seems to be going after families. Has anyone come into town asking for William? Clarence shook his head. Not here, but I doubt he would come here anyway. The saloon would be a better place to look. Maybe we should split up, Williams suggested. I can go check on Mabel, and you two can ask around the saloon. I don't think you should go to Mabel's alone, Jack said. If there's even a chance Holden got there first, it's too dangerous. You two can head out to Mabel's, Clarence said. I'll ask around at the saloon and head over with whatever information I find. Just be careful when you do, Jack said. Holden is dangerous, and you need to prepare for any situation. Got it. I'll bring some good men with me. Here, let me show you where Mabel lives. Clarence returned to the desk at the back of the room and pulled a map of the area from one drawer. William and Jack leaned in to watch as he pointed out their current location and how to get to Mabel's. Thanks, Clarence. Remember, be safe. William shook his hand, thankful for his old friend. You too. William nodded, and he and Jack left the building and mounted up once again, urging their horses toward the west end of town. As they left the main part of town, the houses grew further apart, and the trees became denser. Mabel's ranch was a few miles out of town, but as they grew closer, an ominous feeling descended on William. He scanned the area, not sure what he was looking for, but sure it would stand out when he found it. Jack. His voice was quiet but urgent. Jack pulled his horse to a stop and looked over. William pointed to the horse tracks that had caught his eye. There were at least four different tracks, and they were spaced as if the horses had been separate, not attached to a wagon. Jack nodded and scanned the area again. He could be here already. Keep your eyes open. We must plan accordingly when we get closer. When the ranch came into view, William and Jack dismounted and tied their horses to nearby trees in a grove that would hide them. Four other horses stood tied to the house's porch. Let's get closer and see if we can see inside, Jack said. William nodded, his heartbeat pounding in his head with fear and adrenaline. The two crept up to the house, their eyes open for anything out of place. There was a large front window, but curtains closed off the view. Jack pointed to the left and motioned William to go right. William nodded and crept to the right. His fingers kept a permanent position near his gun. As he rounded the corner, a man came into view. His back was to William, but with his gun drawn and his head swiveling left and right, he appeared to be a lookout. William paused, unsure if the man was friendly or a foe. But when a shout from the inside caused no concern to the man who continued to stand guard, William decided he was one of Holden's men. After a deep breath and a silent prayer, William calmed his nerves and rushed the man, his gun drawn. The man turned just as William reached him, but he had no time to react. William brought the gun against the side of the man's head, and he dropped like a rock. Jack appeared a moment later as William was checking the man's pulse. He's alive, but he'll be out a while. Do you have something to secure him with? In my saddlebags. Why don't you try to get in the house and I'll take care of this one and join you? Jack suggested. Though William didn't like the idea of them splitting up, he agreed and watched Jack hurry back to the horse. After a final glance to make sure the man was still out, William continued around the house until he found the back door. It was locked, as William assumed it would be, and as the front door undoubtedly would be too. And as the front door undoubtedly would be too, William looked around for a rock to break the window. It wouldn't be quiet, but hopefully Jack would follow soon to give him backup. He found the perfect rock a few feet away and tore a piece from his shirt to wrap his hand. It wouldn't block all the noise, but it might make it quiet enough that he could get in without attracting attention, and it would keep the glass from cutting him. With his knuckles wrapped and the rock in his hand for extra power, William tapped the glass as hard and as quietly as he could. Shards flew into the room, tinkling as they hit the floor. 
Though it probably wasn't that loud, it sounded like explosions to William's ears. He shoved his arm in, feeling around for the lock on the door. When his fingers found it, he opened the lock and slipped inside, his gun drawn for protection. Well, well, who do we have here? The voice was hard and cold, and though William had never heard John Holden speak, he assumed the voice belonged to him. He looked up to find two colts and a shotgun pointed down at him. Not even his quick shooting would get him out of this one. Tie him up with the others, boys. William allowed one of the men to snatch the gun from his hand. Fighting now would be useless, but he would keep his eye open for a chance to escape or signal Jack. The other man bound his wrists behind his back and hauled him to his feet. William surveyed the room as he did. He had come in the back and landed squarely in the kitchen, which opened into the living room. Mabel, and the man William presumed was her husband, sat bound and gagged on the couch. Their eyes were wide with fear, but they appeared unharmed. A small child sat between them, tears streaming down his cheeks. The man unceremoniously shoved William onto the couch, causing him to fall against Mabel. Don't worry, everything will be all right, he whispered to her, before the man pulled him back up. So glad you could join us, Wild Bill. The snide tone of Holden's voice infuriated William, but he kept his mouth shut. Now where is Hardesty? I assume you didn't come here all alone. I'm not sure what you mean. William shrugged and kept his voice casual. I was just coming to visit my sister. A loud, coarse laugh burst from Holden's throat. Don't play me for a fool. Your sister barely acknowledged your existence. It was only when I pointed this here gun in her face that she remembered who you were. William smiled his heart at the words. He assumed Mabel was still suffering over the death of their mother, but it still stung. However, he had no time to dwell on that right now. Right now, he needed to distract Holden long enough to give Hardesty time to discover the broken back door. William hoped Hardesty would listen long enough to decide his best bet was the front door. It wasn't a great plan, but William hoped Hardesty's entrance would surprise the men long enough for him to rush Holden. Well, you got me, William said. Then why are you smiling? The man who had tied him up asked. He had dark hair, dull eyes, and a dopey grin. Shut up, Ernest. Holden turned on the man with daggers in his eyes. I'm smiling, William answered in a loud voice, ignoring the tension between the two men. Because I know Hardesty is out there with the sheriff, and the other rangers right now just waiting to take you down. The three of you don't stand a chance. The other man, blonde and a little meaner looking, glanced over at Holden. Maybe we should sneak out the back. I don't want to go back to prison again. No one is going anywhere, Holden roared. But with his attention on the blonde, he didn't notice Ernest pulling the curtain aside to look out the front window. In quick succession, there was a loud bang, a scream, the sound of breaking glass, and a thud as Ernest hit the floor. William figured this was his chance, and before Holden could aim the gun at them, he charged him. Another shot and a stinging sensation erupted in his arm, but he connected with Holden and his gun went flying. The front door flew open then, and someone took the blonde out before he could fire a shot. William landed on Holden and punched at his face until Hardesty and the sheriff pulled William off. Thanks for making it on time, Clarence. William breathed a sigh of relief as the sheriff secured Holden. Well, I couldn't let you boys have all the fun. As soon as I asked around about Holden, the bartender told me he'd come into town last night asking about you. I hightailed it here as fast as I could, and I guess it's a good thing I did. You may go by William now, but you still act like the wild bill I read about in the papers. William ignored the comment and turned his attention to Jack as he cut off the rope securing his hands. Thanks for not letting me down. Two other men rushed to Mabel, her husband and child, and cut their ropes off as well. Thanks for speaking loud enough for us to hear. Hardesty's eyes widened. William, 
You've been shot. William touched his arm and tried not to grimace. I think it's just a scratch. Let's get it looked at anyway. William nodded and watched as Ernest, the blonde, and Holden were all led out of the house by the sheriff and a few of the townsmen. Did you tell them about the other one outside? I did. He's being taken care of. Jack turned and looked at Mabel and her family. I'll go get the town doctor. As Jack Hardesty walked out of the house, William turned his attention to Mabel. Are you okay? Mabel glanced at her husband before answering. Shaken, but I think we're okay. William, I'm sorry about what Holden said. I thought he'd let us go if I told him we weren't talking. It's okay, Mabel. I understand. Mabel nodded and turned to her husband. I'd like you to meet my son Charles and my husband David. David, this is my half-brother William. Thank you for coming to rescue us. David stood and stepped toward William, his hand out to shake William's. William nodded and shook the outstretched hand. You are welcome. I'm just sorry my past caught up with you. It's not who I am anymore. He looked directly at Mabel, hoping she could see how he'd changed from the impulsive young man she'd known. Mabel bit her bottom lip and her eyes dropped to the floor a moment before meeting his gaze again. William, I'm so sorry for the way I acted before. These last few years, David, she smiled at her husband, has shown me how wrong I was to turn my back on you. You are the only family I have. And while I would never wish that man on anyone, I am rather glad he brought you back into my life. With those words, complete and utter joy filled William. Mabel took a timid step toward him as if unsure how to proceed. He opened up his good arm and she rushed into it, wrapping her arms around him. As tears flooded his eyes, William wasn't sure who was happier. Mabel wiped tears from her own eyes as she leaned back and looked up at William. Please tell me you can stay for dinner with us. William thought about Emma waiting for him back home. He wanted to get back home to her, but he had a chance to reconnect with his sister, and he was sure Emma would understand. Of course I will. Jack and the doctor showed up a few minutes later and David showed them the bedroom where William could have a little privacy while the doctor examined his arm. You're very lucky, the man said as he finished wrapping the bandage. The bullet barely grazed your arm, but you'll need to keep the bandage on for a few days and clean the wound to avoid infection. Thank you, sir. I can do that. As the doctor left, Jack pulled William to the side. I can't thank you enough. I will personally make sure Holden doesn't escape again, so we can keep your family safe. All of them. His eyes slid to Mabel and her husband. Thank you, Mr. Hardesty, David said, as he led Jack to the front door. I don't want to think about what would have happened if you hadn't shown up. Just doing my duty, but I'm also glad things turned out as well as they did. With that, he tipped his hat and headed out. Why don't Charles and I rustle up dinner so you two can catch up? David asked taking the child's hand and leaving Mabel and William alone in the living room. As an uncomfortable silence fell on them, the two took a seat on the couch. Mabel cleared her throat and then her gaze fell to the floor. I was sorry to hear about Catherine. I should have been there for the wedding and the funeral. I'm sorry. William swallowed the emotion that erupted at the mention of Catherine's name. Thank you. I wish you had known her. She was a beautiful woman. You don't live here anymore. Where did you go when you left? Honestly, I simply needed to get out. Catherine's memory was everywhere around here, so I left and joined the Texas Rangers. From there, I was introduced to bounty hunting, which I did up until recently. What happened recently? Mabel's eyes finally pulled from the floor and met his gaze. William smiled as images of Emma flooded his mind. I met another woman. Her name is Emma, and she's waiting for me back at Sage Creek. I asked her to marry me. A smile lighted Mabel's features. That's wonderful, William. When is the wedding to be? As soon as possible. 
We hadn't set a date yet, but after today, I want to marry her as soon as I can. You should make the most of the time you have together. Mabel placed a hand on his arm and stared into his eyes. You never know when it will end. William knew she was talking about the death of her parents, their mother in particular. Mabel, I'm so sorry about mother. No, I'm sorry, William. I was angry because I didn't believe in God like mother did. I couldn't believe a loving God would take her away when I needed her. But David showed me how bad things happen in life, but God's love keeps us going. He reminded me that this world is not our home and that I'll see mother again someday. William glanced toward the kitchen. You found a good husband, Mabel. I'm so pleased that God sent you a strong Christian man. Mabel's smile turned from a wistful one to one full of love. Me too. Now, I know we aren't close, but you better send a telegraph when you have that wedding planned. I want to be there and meet this Emma. I'll do that. William placed his hand on top of Mabel's and squeezed it, glad that God had brought them back together at last. Chapter 18 Emma Emma sat at the table reading the Bible. This was her favorite time of the day, early evening when her sisters were getting ready for bed and her brothers were outside doing their chores. Sometimes her father would read with her, but today he had stayed at work late, so it was just Emma at the table alone. Suddenly, the front door slammed open and a panting Benjamin raced in. Emma, come quick! What is it? Fear flooded Emma as she pushed her chair back and stood. It's William, come quick! William, he was back? It had only been a few days. Emma's heart soared and then sank. Did that mean the mission had been successful, or had they failed and Holden was still out there? She found she didn't care as long as William was alive. Emma hurried after Benjamin, who rushed out of the house and towards the barn. William was climbing off his horse with Samuel's help as they approached. Emma wondered why Samuel was having to lend an arm, until William turned and she saw the bandage on his arm. Oh my goodness! William, what happened? Emma rushed to his side and let her eyes roam his body as she looked for more injuries. He held up his good hand and smiled at her. It's just a scratch. The bullet barely grazed me. Don't worry. I'm fine. Emma placed her hands on her hips and cocked her head. Why is it you keep coming to me with bullet holes? It's not good for my heart. The words were playful but held a serious note as well. William's smile grew into a full grin. Because I know what a good nurse you are, and it gives me an excuse to be close to you. With his good arm, he circled her waist and pulled her to him. Ew, gross! Benjamin rolled his eyes and stuck out his tongue. Come on, let's go finish our chores, Samuel said with a laugh as he led Benjamin into the barn. You don't need an excuse to be close to me, Emma sighed, enjoying the feel of his arm around her. We'll be getting married soon. And I can't wait. His brown eyes twinkled down at her. Nor can I wait for this. His head tilted down as his lips found hers. Though he had only been gone a few days, Emma's heart sped up and her knees trembled. Will we have to postpone the wedding so you can heal? She asked when the kiss ended and she regained her breath. William shook his head. No, the wound is almost healed, but I do need a few more days to get the house completed. However, this mission showed me the importance of family and not wasting any time. Emma's brow rose on her forehead. Did something happen? I mean, besides you getting shot? A laugh escaped William's lips and his grin grew. A lot did, and I'll tell you about it, but can we go inside? I'd like to stretch out. I rode all day to get back to you. Of course. Emma mentally chastised herself. How could she not recognize his need for rest? Come in, and I'll scoop up some soup for you. The girls were getting ready for bed, but I'm sure they'd love to see you. Jenny's high-pitched squeal reached them before the front door officially opened. 
William, you're back! She flew out of the house, a blur of white in her long nightgown, and threw her arms around William's legs. Hey, Jenny. He smiled at her and touched the top of her head. I'm glad to see you, too. What happened to your arm? Are you okay? The fear in Jenny's voice matched the expression in her eyes as she looked from William to Emma and back again. He's fine, Jenny, but tired. Can we let him lie down? Emma's voice was gentle but firm. Oh, right. Come on, William. I'll take you to the couch. Jenny tugged his hand and led him into the house. Emma followed behind with a smile on her face. Injured or not, it was good to have William home. William William sighed a little as he followed Jenny's lead into the living room. It wasn't that he didn't enjoy Emma's family, but after the harrowing experience and riding all day, he wanted to fall into a soft bed and sleep for a day or two. Welcome back, William, Carrie said softly as she entered the room. Her long blonde hair was undone and fell nearly to her waist. Thank you, Carrie. William collapsed onto the couch, letting the exhaustion of the last few days flow out of him. As Jenny sat on one side and Emma took the other, the front door flew open and Benjamin ran in, followed by Samuel. Can you tell us what happened now? Benjamin's eyes lit up as he jumped up and down at the corner of the couch. Did you catch the bad guy? We did, bud, but it's been a long day. Can I give you the details tomorrow? Benjamin's face fell and his shoulders dropped. Okay. All right, everyone, let's get to bed and let William rest. Emma stood and took Jenny's hand, leading her toward the bedroom. Carrie followed as Samuel led Benjamin to the other bedroom. William took off his boots and stretched out on the couch. He wasn't planning to fall asleep, but as his head touched the arm of the couch and his eyes closed, Darkness descended on him. Chapter 19 Emma How are you feeling this morning? Emma asked as William walked into the kitchen the next morning. Better. I'm sorry I fell asleep on you last night before I could tell you my story. And thank you for the couch. I would have put you in Pa's room if you hadn't fallen asleep on the couch. Emma poured coffee into a mug and handed it to him with a smile. I tried to rouse you, but it was no use. You were not waking. William took the mug and flashed a warm smile in return. It was a crazy few days. Shall I tell you about it now? He pulled out a chair and sat at the table. You could. Emma sat across from him and cupped her mug, enjoying the warmth it exuded. But you'll probably have to retell the story when the rest of the family wakes. They'll be wanting to hear it, too. That's okay. William paused as he took a sip of the hot liquid. I don't mind telling it again. Emma took a sip of her own mug of coffee flavored with milk and sugar, and therefore more of a brown color than William's stark black. She turned to him and listened as he told his story. William, you are so lucky that you weren't injured more. Please tell me you won't do this again. William smiled and took her hand. Holden is back in custody, and while there are other outlaws I helped bring in out there, I have no plans to go chasing after them. In fact, I wanted to ask you about our wedding. After reuniting with my sister and catching up on lost time, I realized I don't want to waste any more. I think I can finish the house this week if Jesse will help me. Do you think you can be ready? Surprise and elation filled Emma. She couldn't wait to marry William either, but she hadn't thought he would suggest such a short engagement. Could she be ready in that little time? I need to bake the cake, of course, and get some flowers. Make sure the church is free, but I'm sure that won't be an issue. The biggest thing will be altering the dress. I'm using the same dress I wore when I married Joseph, but I'd like to alter it some for a fresh start. You will look beautiful in whatever you wear. William's eyes roved over her face. But I'm willing to wait if you need more time. Emma shook her head. No, I think with Kate's and Carrie's help, I can be ready in a week. Good. 
it's settled then. He squeezed her hand, and then their moment was broken by the entrance of the rest of her siblings. They bombarded William with questions, so Emma began making breakfast. As she scrambled up eggs, she could barely contain the smile that played across her lips. In less than a week, she would be married again, and she couldn't wait. William Thank you again for your help, William said, as he and Jesse dismounted and tied up the horses. There isn't much left to finish, but with only one arm completely working, it would have taken me much longer than a week. No problem. Jesse picked up the bucket containing the gray cement mixture from the porch and began scanning for any cracks. Just out of curiosity, though, is there a reason for such a short engagement? This incident with Holden just reminded me that we don't know how much time we have. I don't want to waste any of it. William picked up a trowel and added some mixture to a small crack in the wall. Because he had the money, he had opted to build a stone house, and their goal today was daubing, filling any cracks in so that the house would stay warmer come winter. After they completed filling the cracks, he only needed to finish furnishing it. I can understand that. Jesse leaned closer to the wall and applied some coating. Will Emma be able to get everything she needs in so little time, though? William chuckled and raised an eyebrow. I guess that depends on your wife as well. I'm sure Emma is over there right now getting help on whatever alterations she wants to make to her wedding dress. Jesse's laugh was full and hearty. I guess it's a good thing Kate picked up some sewing techniques in the last few months then. I'm sure she is enjoying helping Emma. She didn't get to plan much for our wedding. He stepped back and narrowed his eyes as he scanned for any remaining cracks. Has it been hard for you? Has what been hard? Jesse smoothed another area and then dropped the trowel back in the bucket. Retiring, you know, giving up law enforcement? Jesse ran a hand down his cheek as he thought. Well, I wasn't a deputy sheriff for long. Remember, I only became one to avenge Pauline's death. After Kate and I married, I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue. When Kate told me she was with child, I knew I needed to step down and return to ranching. Not being a deputy doesn't ensure my safety, but it gives me better odds of avoiding being shot. So I guess to answer your question, no, it hasn't been that hard. Did you avenge her death? William leaned down to get more caulking. I guess we got all the guys who were involved in her death, but it never really made me feel better. Yeah, I can understand that feeling. Nothing eased my guilt after losing Catherine either. Are you having second thoughts? William sighed. Not second thoughts, so much as a worry. What if I can't do this life? I mean, I was a deputy sheriff and a Texas ranger before I was a bounty hunter. All I know is action, and to be truthful... There was a bit of excitement the last few days that I've missed. No one said you had to just sit at home. I mean, I understand you have the money, but you could still work. You must, in fact, to keep this farm running. Farming is a different kind of work, but it's still work. That is true, and I'm sure God will help me find content with my life. I promised Emma it would be the last time I went chasing outlaws. A look of amusement crossed Jesse's face, and he nodded. I have no doubt God will keep you fulfilled. Besides, Emma is the kind of woman who will keep you on your toes. William smiled as he pictured his flaxen-haired fiance. She was definitely a spitfire woman, but he loved that most of all about her. She wants kids, you know, a whole house full. Jesse took off his hat and wiped sweat from his forehead. Though only late morning, the sun was beating down. He replaced his hat and regarded William a moment. Are you not keen on the idea? It's not that I don't want them. William paused as he thought about what he wanted to say. But this life isn't easy, and I'm not sure I can handle any more loss. You have a baby on the way. Aren't you afraid? Maybe a little, but I can't live my life in fear. I have to trust that God will protect my family. You're right. William took a step back and regarded his handiwork. Well, I think the outside is finished. Now I just have to finish the inside. What else needs to be done? William ran a hand across his chin, 
covered in stubble from lack of shaving. I already made the dining table and chairs. There's a bed as well, but I'd like a few small tables and a couch. Of course, those aren't necessary to have before moving in. Do you think Emma would mind if not all the furniture was finished? I think Emma will love it regardless. It will definitely be the biggest house in town. Is that a bad thing? William didn't want to appear ostentatious. He hadn't even thought about the size when he had planned the house. He just wanted something big enough to have a family in. No, I think it's what this town needs. I've been in plenty of other towns that have large ranch houses. We have been behind the times, but maybe seeing this will inspire others to dream bigger. I'd like to enlarge my own homestead. Perhaps you'd be amenable to helping? Jesse punctuated his crooked smile with an eyebrow raise. Of course, my friend. We should look at doing that soon with that baby on the way. It can wait until you heal completely. The last thing I want is Emma on my case about re-injuring you or making that wound worse. William smiled and clapped his friend on his shoulder with his good hand. You're right about that. She is a good nurse, but I'd rather suffer no more injuries. How about we look at the wood in the barn and see if we have enough to make the couch? The tables can probably wait, but I'm guessing Emma would like a place to sit in the living room. Lead the way. Chapter 20 Emma Emma smiled as she checked another item off the list. William's wound was officially healed. She had removed the bandage last night. Carrie had agreed to make the cake as she was a better baker than Emma, and William had spoken with the pastor yesterday about using the church for the wedding after church on Sunday, to which he'd agreed. That left only flowers and the dress. She planned to take Jenny to the nearby wild sage fields tomorrow and gather flowers to decorate with, so that only left the alterations. She and Kate started them a few days ago, but it was taking longer than Emma had expected to get the dress looking just right. However, she was certain today they would finish it. With a skip in her step, Emma grabbed her sewing basket and the dress and headed out the door to Kate's house. Jenny and Benjamin were in school, and Carrie had traveled into town earlier to get the few ingredients they didn't have for the cake, so the walk was quiet this morning. Emma used the time to revisit her checklist to make sure everything was in order. Morning, Emma. The voice stopped her feet and pulled her back to the present. Emma turned to see Carl a few feet behind her. Her good mood dissipated like a late morning fog, and she struggled to keep a smile on her face. Though once her friend, Carl hadn't taken kindly to William capturing her affection. Thankfully, he had been around little since William returned, which had pleased Emma. Though she had once enjoyed Carl's company, the few times they had crossed paths recently had been uncomfortable and stilted. Hello, Carl. How are you today? Emma tried her best to make her voice sound chipper and friendly. I'm glad I ran into you. He paused, shoved his hands into his pockets, and studied the ground a moment before meeting her eyes again. I wanted to apologize for my behavior. I had no right to lay claim to you, and I'm sorry. Emma blinked at him, unsure of what to say. She certainly hadn't expected this turn of events. I wanted to inform you I've been corresponding with a woman out east. She seems nice by her letters, and I'm considering bringing her out here. Like mail order? Emma asked. Carl nodded. It worked for Jesse and Kate, so I figured perhaps it could work for me too. While that wasn't exactly how Jesse and Kate had ended up together, Emma felt no need to correct him. That's wonderful, Carl. This time, Emma didn't have to feign happiness. She was glad he had found someone. He wasn't the man for her, but he deserved a good woman. I'll be praying that everything works out for you. Thank you. His eyes dropped to the ground again. Well, anyway, I just wanted to let you know that and to tell you I won't be bothering you anymore. He flashed an awkward wave and then turned around and walked off. Emma watched him go and waved when he glanced back once. Then she thanked God for answered prayers and continued to Kate's house. 
The Jennings house was much smaller than the house William was building, but Kate had made it homey with her personal touches. Come on in. Kate smiled as she opened the door. I just set some water to boiling to make tea. Tea sounds amazing. How are you feeling today? Emma glanced at her friend as she sat down in Kate's kitchen and placed her sewing bag on the floor beside her. Big! Kate chuckled as she filled two mugs with hot water. I have already had to let out two of my dresses. I'm afraid I'll have nothing to wear soon. We could work on a maternity dress together after we finish my wedding dress. Emma took the tea Kate offered and blew on it, watching the steam curl into floaty wisps of air. And after the wedding, of course. That would be wonderful. I don't feel prepared at all. Kate looked around the small house. I mean, we don't even have a second bedroom. Well, William told me he and Jesse plan to enlarge your homestead as soon as they finish ours. Really? That would be wonderful. Kate's petite shoulders heaved with a hearty sigh. I know Jesse had hoped for a second story when he built this house. And I know he wants to start making a cradle, but where would we put it? The living room? Emma inspected the room as she took a sip of her tea and smiled at Kate's lack of knowledge. You would keep the cradle in your room for a time. The baby will be small for a good six months. Kate smiled over the rim of her cup. That is true. I'm so glad you and I became friends. You have younger siblings and can tell me all about how to raise a baby. I only had a brother, and we were very close in age, so I don't remember when he was young. Emma laughed as she thought back over the years. She and Jenny were so far apart in years that she definitely remembered her as a baby getting into everything. Jenny had always been a little handful. I ran into Carl on the way over, Emma said, changing the subject. Kate's eyes widened and her brows inched up her forehead as she took a sip of her tea. How did that go? Interesting. He stopped me to tell me he's been corresponding with a woman back east. Mail order bride like you. He thinks he might bring her here soon. Well, that's unexpected, but good, right? Absolutely. While I knew William was the man for me, I always felt bad about Carl. I'm delighted he's found someone, and I hope he will be as happy as you and Jesse. Let's just hope she's not some outlaw using mail order as a ruse. Kate laughed, referencing her own crazy experience. Kate had answered a mail order bride ad, but when she'd arrived, she found out the man she was betrothed to was a criminal. She'd escaped, and thankfully her path crossed with Jessie's, who, to keep her from having to go back east, offered her marriage. Their love only grew from there. Let's hope not. We've had enough excitement for some time. Emma finished her tea and grabbed her bag. Shall we move to the living room and finish this up? Kate nodded and tipped her mug back, finishing the last drop. Emma stepped out of her dress and into the wedding gown. So far, they had adjusted the neckline and added some lace around the bottom edge. Today, Emma hoped to add lace detailing to the sleeves. She pulled out the lace she had found at the mercantile the other day and handed it to Kate, who pinned it to the dress so Emma could stitch it on after she removed the dress. Does it need anything else? Emma turned in a slow circle for Kate to get a full view. Kate narrowed her eyes as she scanned the dress. I don't think so. It looks beautiful. And with your hair pinned up, it will be amazing. Wonderful. Taking care to avoid the pins, Emma removed the dress and handed it to Kate, while she changed back into her other dress. Suddenly, Kate's front door burst open, and a breathless Carrie entered, her blonde hair flying behind her. Emma, come quick! There's something wrong with Jenny! What's wrong with her? Emma quickly finished fastening her dress and tried to tame the fear clawing at her heart. I have no idea... She vomited at school and has some kind of rash. Pa said to come get you. The fear turned to ice and snaked through Emma's veins. Illnesses were never good, but they were often worse when they struck children. Should I come too? Kate asked. No, Emma said forcefully. You need to stay far away and protect your baby. Hopefully it's nothing serious. 
I'll send word when I can. Forgetting both her dress and her bag, Emma followed Carrie outside and climbed into the wagon beside Samuel and Benjamin. Pa had sent the whole family to get her? This wasn't good. Emma was the first out of the wagon when they arrived at their house. She thundered up the steps, but before she could enter the house, Doc Moore opened the door and closed it behind him. Emma, you can't come in. I think it's scarlet fever. Emma's hand flew to her mouth as her eyes widened. Pa, are you sure? Scarlet fever was the worst sickness they had seen, but it would explain why he had sent everyone to get her. He would have wanted the rest of the family out of the house as quickly as possible in hopes of keeping them from catching the illness. While the fever had spared their town during the last outbreak, stories of the deaths from neighboring towns had reached them. Emma remembered that her pa had said once a household was affected, nearly all the children in the house had gotten sick. I'm almost sure. His voice was grave as he nodded. She has three of the symptoms, vomiting, fever, and a rash. You need to do some things for me. Are you listening? Though shocked, Emma managed to nod. She barely registered her siblings joining them on the porch. Good. First, you need to go to the school and ask them to close it down for at least a week. I have no idea where she contracted it, but we need to contain the spreading if possible. Second, you need to take your brothers and sisters to yours and William's homestead. But, Pa, it's not finished yet, Emma said. It's close enough. See if you can borrow some blankets from some of the neighbors if William doesn't have enough. I understand it won't be the same as your beds, but it will do until Jenny gets better, or... Is Jenny going to die? Benjamin's voice trembled with fear. Don't even think it, Emma replied, as tears filled her eyes. She will be okay. Of course she will, Doc Moore said. Finally, you'll have to cover the clinic for a few days. I realize you hadn't planned on spending much time there anymore, and this will delay your wedding, but I can't leave Jenny. You'll need to watch yourself, too, all of you. You've been exposed. If you start to feel feverish or get chills or a rash, close the clinic. Can I check on her? How will I know if she's okay? Emma's heart felt like it was breaking in two. Though Jenny was only her sister and not her daughter, she had practically raised her as such. Doc Moore tapped his forehead for a bit as he thought. I'll put a white towel in the window to inform you she's okay. If the towel disappears, come in and check on us. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it would work for now. If you need anything while you're in there, write it down and we'll leave it on the porch. Emma wanted to say more, but she didn't know what. Good idea. Doc Moore's eyes moved from one child to the next, as if he were memorizing their faces. Take care of yourselves. I better get in and check on her. Pa, Emma said as he began to close the door. He looked at her a mixture of questions and fear in his eyes. Don't forget to pray. You too. And then the door closed in their faces. Emma turned back to the steps, her gait much slower this time. Carrie took one of her hands and Benjamin grabbed the other. Though neither said a word, Emma could feel the fear radiating off both of them. I'll go get a horse ready for you, Samuel said before hurrying off to the barn. What's wrong with Jenny? Benjamin turned big eyes up at her. His voice was quieter than Emma had ever heard it. Pa thinks it's scarlet fever, Emma said. Beside her, Carrie sucked in her breath, but Benjamin was too young to remember the last outbreak. I don't understand. He looked from one girl to the other. What's scarlet fever? Emma bit her lip as she tried to decide how to explain it so his 12-year-old brain could comprehend it. It's a sickness, and it's not good. We must pray hard for Jenny. Can you do that? Benjamin's eyes filled with tears, but he nodded. I'll pray every hour. He bit his bottom lip and glanced away. Emma, she's not sick because I got mad at her, is she? Oh, no. Carrie let go of Emma's hand and wrapped her arm around the boy. You didn't cause Jenny to get sick, Benjamin. This is not your fault. Sometimes people get sick, Emma said, 
It's why Pa became a doctor, to try to help them. Samuel appeared then with one of their horses saddled and ready. Thank you. Emma took the reins and addressed Samuel. Go to William. I'll catch up, but I have to do the errands for Pa first. No, Emma, I want to go with you, Carrie said. Emma shook her head. There's no room on the horse. I'll be faster alone, and I promise I'll be there soon. Both Carrie and Benjamin looked unconvinced, but they climbed up into the wagon. Samuel flicked the reins and the wagon drove off. Emma spared one final glance at her pa's place and managed a tight smile when she saw the white towel in the window. Then she grabbed the reins of the chestnut mare and swung up on the saddle. If she hurried, she might reach the school before Margaret Goodman left. If not, she knew where the woman lived. Margaret was just locking the schoolhouse door when Emma rode up. Hey, Emma! The petite brunette looked up at her, using her hand as a shield against the setting sun. Did Benjamin or Jenny forget something? She said she wasn't feeling well today, but I thought they got everything before they left. Emma dismounted and walked closer before answering. No, Pa sent me to tell you that he thinks Jenny has scarlet fever. Margaret's blue eyes widened in fear. Is he sure? He said he was almost sure. He sent me to ask you if any other children have had fevers, chills, or rashes, and to tell you to watch out for those symptoms. Margaret shook her head. I have noticed none of those symptoms, not even with Jenny, and no one has been absent, but I'll keep my eye on them all. Thank you. Pa recommended closing the school for at least a week until we're sure no one else gets sick. We'll keep Benjamin home regardless until we are sure he doesn't have it. I understand. Margaret issued a succinct nod. I'll be praying for Jenny. Tears pricked Emma's eyes once again, and she thanked Margaret before mounting up again and heading to the clinic. Once there, she found some paper and a pencil and wrote out a brief note. Doc Moore is tending to a patient with possible scarlet fever. Please be on the lookout for fever, chills, vomiting, and a rash. Emma will tend the clinic in Doc Moore's absence. Should you need care while no one is here, please come to William Cook's homestead. Satisfied, Emma placed the paper in the window and locked up the clinic. She had done all she could for now. The rest was in God's hands. William William heard the wagon approach before he actually saw it. He looked up at Jesse, who returned the same questioning gaze. Who in the world could be approaching in such a hurry? The two men walked to the front door, and William glanced at the rifle in the corner. Should he grab it? Before he could decide, the voice of Carrie, Emma's younger sister, carried into the house. William? Her voice was shrill and filled with worry. William, are you here? His heart plummeted. If Carrie was calling, did that mean something had happened to Emma? Forgetting the gun, he threw open the front door to see Samuel helping Benjamin and Carrie down from the wagon. As soon as her feet hit the ground, Carrie flew into his arms, burying her head against his chest. Oh, William, she's sick. Emma? But I just saw her yesterday. William blinked in disbelief. What could have happened to Emma so quickly? No, not Emma. Carrie stepped back and wiped tears from her cheek. Jenny, Pa says it's scarlet fever. Scarlet fever? William had been in enough towns to have seen an outbreak of scarlet fever. It was one of the deadliest diseases, mainly because there appeared to be no cure. Doctors would often let blood out of the patients to try to get rid of the infection that way, but for the most part, it meant quarantine and hoping that the child was strong enough to fight it off. I should go check on Kate. Fear danced in Jesse's eyes as he stepped into the conversation. That's a good idea. In fact, why don't you stay with her until we know none of the others have it, William suggested. Though he appreciated Jesse's help, he didn't want to do anything to jeopardize the health of his friend's baby. Are you sure? Jesse asked, but William could hear a tiny thread of relief in his voice. Yes, of course. Samuel and Benjamin can help me with the final touches around here. Jesse nodded and hurried over to the tree where his horse stood tied up. 
In mere seconds, he had the horse untied and was up in the saddle. He flashed a wave and then rode off toward the outskirts of town where he and Kate lived. Carrie, it will be okay. William turned his attention back to the girl. Where is Emma? She had to do some errands for Pa. Samuel approached carrying two burlap bags. Benjamin trailed slightly behind him, carrying a sack of his own. Pa made us gather some clothes before he sent us to get Emma. He held up the bags. Where do you want us to put them? Let's take them inside, William said. Though he didn't have all the furniture yet, he had the space for everyone. With his money, he had opted to build a three-bedroom house. Samuel nodded and led the way into the house, followed by Benjamin. Carrie and William rounded out the end. Before closing the door, William took one last look around for Emma, but the air was still. He hoped she was okay. Okay, Samuel, why don't you and Benjamin set up in this room? William opened the door to one of the empty rooms. He had wanted the inside of the house to be a surprise for Emma, but that would not happen now. There's no mattress yet, but perhaps we can go to the mercantile in a bit and see what they have. Get some blankets, at least. We're fine sleeping on the floor. Samuel dropped the two burlap bags on the hard ground. Speak for yourself, Benjamin muttered under his breath. William smiled and shook his head. No one has to sleep directly on the ground. We'll figure something out. He led the way to the next room, which was about the same size, but already held a bed, a mirror, and a dresser. This was the room he had been sleeping in. Carrie, you and Emma can sleep here where I've been staying, and I'll take the last room. It's not an ideal situation with us being unmarried, but surely people will understand. While I agree that is an issue, I think Jenny dying is a much bigger one, Carrie mumbled. Jenny's dying? Benjamin asked in a squeaky voice. A wet sheen coated his eyes, and William knew tears weren't far behind. Nobody's saying that. Samuel put an arm around Benjamin's shoulders and shot Carrie a pointed look. But Jenny is very sick. We should all pray for her. Yes, that's a great idea, William hurriedly agreed. He wanted to change the subject from the uncomfortable topic of Jenny's possible death. Let's do that now. The four formed a small circle, and William bowed his head. Lord, we come to you now, thanking you for family and lifting up one of our own. Please be with Jenny and help heal her. Give Doc Moore the wisdom to make the right choices for her care. Please keep the illness from spreading to us and the rest of the town. He paused and took a deep breath. And please keep Emma safe in her errands and bring her back to us. Amen. The children echoed their amens and then traded fearful stares. It wasn't that they didn't believe God could heal Jenny, but they knew from the death of their mother that sometimes God didn't choose that option. As William tried to think of what to say to cheer them up, the pounding of a horse's hooves reached his ears. Emma, he breathed and hurried to the front door. Without checking first, he flung the door open to see Emma sliding off her mare and tying the reins to a slat in the porch railing. Her eyes met his and she sped into his arms. Wetness from her cheeks seeped through his shirt. Don't worry. William stroked her hair and tried to calm her. Everything will be okay. You can't know that, she sobbed. She's so little. She is, but she's also strong, and she has your father with her, remember? He placed a hand under her chin and tilted her face up. Her eyes were red and swollen, her face mottled from crying. I can't think of any doctor I'd trust more. Can you? She shook her head and sniffed. Good, now the others are getting settled in, so why don't you dry your tears and we'll join them? Emma nodded and took a few deep breaths. With each one, her shoulders pulled a little straighter. Finally, she nodded again and flashed a tight smile. Okay, I'm all right now. William knew this was only temporary. More emotion and more worry would hit her as the days went on, but he would take it for now. Then allow me to show you your new home. Emma's eyes widened as if she just realized what that meant. I'm sorry, I know you wanted this to be a surprise. It's all right. William offered a smile and pushed open the front door. 
Life doesn't always turn out exactly as we planned. He stepped back through the doorway and gestured to the open room. This is the living room. It will look more homey once we have all the furniture, but it's just been me. There was a wooden table and a few chairs at the far side of the room near the kitchen, and a couch frame that desperately needed some cushions in the living room. But otherwise, the space was devoid of furniture. It was not, however, empty of people, and Benjamin and Carrie rushed to Emma's side as she stepped in. It will be wonderful. Emma wrapped her arms around her siblings, and William could tell she hoped she wouldn't be wrong. Chapter 21 Emma After unpacking hers and Carrie's few clothes, Emma wandered into the kitchen. William really had spared no expense. A large stove sat at the back, and shelves hung from one side of the room. An icebox and a deep sink filled the other wall. Emma ran her hand over the shelves, enjoying the smoothness of the hand-sanded wood. William had even etched a decorative line in the oak. He came up behind her and placed his hands on her arms. I have some food, but we should get more. In fact, why don't you poke around and see what we might need? Samuel and I will go into town and get it. Emma nodded and took a deep breath. Okay, I can do that. I guess Pa had them pack a few clothes before he sent them to get me, so we should be good there. But we'll need blankets and maybe a few pillows. Do you have cooking utensils? It's how I've been eating. William's eyes twinkled as he turned her around, and his voice held a teasing tone. He ran his hands up and down her arms. Right. Emma nodded and repeated the word a few times. A fog filled her head, leaving her unable to focus on anything. Paper? William's brow crinkled. That might be a little harder to get. Let's go see. He stepped past Emma into the kitchen and began opening the cabinets. Aha, I figured I had some, he said. With a triumphant smile, he pulled some butcher paper from a cabinet and held it out to her. Thank you. She took the paper and returned to the kitchen table. Do you have a writing utensil? William's mouth twisted to the side a second before his eyes lit up and he snapped his fingers. Be right back. As he headed down the hallway, Carrie and Benjamin entered. Anything we can help with? Carrie asked. Yes, do you want to inventory the food and see what we might need? Emma asked. William and Samuel will head into town shortly to pick up a few things. Can I help? Benjamin asked. Of course you can. Carrie grinned at him and ruffled his hair. Emma smiled at her two siblings, but she couldn't help noticing that though the two smiled in return, the usual light in their eyes had dulled. She imagined she would see the same thing in her eyes were she to glance in a mirror. William returned with a pencil as Carrie began moving things on the shelves. I suspected I had one near my Bible. I always like to make notes to help with my reading. Are you three good in here? I'd like to find Samuel and get the wagon ready. Yes, go ahead, Emma said, both to William and to Carrie. William leaned down and kissed her forehead before leaving the room, and Emma wrote as Carrie relayed what stock William already had. When Carrie finished, dismay covered Emma as she realized how short the list was. They would need much more food. A tiny sliver of guilt crept in as she realized how much this would cost. William hadn't expected to have to be feeding her family. That was her pa's job. But he had the money now where they didn't. However, pa could repay him when he got out of quarantine, and Emma would use the money she earned at the clinic to pay William until then. Emma, are you okay? Emma shook her head and looked up into Carrie's concerned face. Yes, sorry. Can you write down what ingredients you imagine we'll need in the next few days? I just can't seem to get my head focused. Carrie nodded and Emma slid the butcher paper to her. Benjamin climbed into Emma's lap and placed his hands on her cheek, something he hadn't done in years. Emma, is Jenny going to get better? Tears pricked Emma's eyes and emotions swelled in her throat. 
She wrapped her arms around Benjamin and pulled him close as she whispered into his hair. I don't know, sweetheart, but we will pray as hard as we can that she does, okay? Can we pray again now? He asked. William prayed with us earlier, but I think it might be good to pray with you too. Absolutely we can. Do you want to do it? Emma knew Samuel and Pa had been working with Benjamin, teaching him how to pray like a man of God. He nodded, and a tremble accompanied his childlike voice as he began. God, please don't let Jenny die. I know she tries my patience sometimes, but she really is a good little sister, and we'd miss her terribly if she were gone. Keep her and Pa safe and the rest of us too. Amen. It was a simple prayer, the prayer of a child, but somehow Emma believed God heard it all the same, if not louder. That was a great prayer, she said, with what little voice she could muster. Emotions constricted her throat. I hope it works, Benjamin said. Here, I believe this will be good. Carrie shoved the butcher paper across the table before wiping her own eyes. Emma scanned the list and added pillows and blankets at the bottom. I'm going to take this to William, Emma said, hugging Benjamin again before lifting him off her lap. I'll be right back. She made her way outside and towards the barn. Samuel was sitting in the wagon seat ready to go, and William was leaning against the wagon, evidently waiting for her. She handed him the list and watched as he scanned it. Did you get everything you needed written down? I think so. Emma took a deep breath before continuing. It's a lot, William. I feel terrible asking you to pay for all of this. Money is simply that, Emma. Money. It's not mine. God gave it to me to manage, and this is how God would want it spent. You are an amazing man, William. Emma's eyes brimmed with tears. And you are an amazing woman. William pulled her in for a kiss and then climbed up in the wagon beside Samuel. We'll be back soon, he said, as the wagon headed for town. Emma waved and watched the wagon until it was out of sight. Then she took another deep breath, squared her shoulders, and prepared to put on a brave face for her brother and sister. William The ride into town was quiet, but William had no idea what to say. There just weren't good words when your sister was sick, and the stark reality was that she might not recover. Samuel pulled the wagon to a stop in front of the general store. Here, take the list and get everything on it, William said to Samuel. I'm going to ask the sheriff to alert the neighboring towns and see if anyone can spare their doctor, but I'll be right back. Samuel nodded and took the paper from William. Without a word, he tied up the horses and headed into the store. William climbed down and headed to the sheriff's office. Sheriff Johnson looked up as he entered. What can I do for you, William? Doc Moore suspects Jenny has scarlet fever. Sheriff Johnson's eyes widened in fear, but William continued. Can we alert the nearby towns to warn them? Also, if an outbreak occurs, can we send word asking for another doctor? Doc Moore has quarantined himself in the house with Jenny. I'll get right on it. Where is the rest of the family staying? With me, the house was almost finished since Emma and I had planned on getting married on Sunday. Of course, the wedding will be on hold until Jenny is better, but they can stay with me as long as necessary. That's good of you, William. I'll be praying for you all. Thank you, Sheriff. I appreciate that. I best be getting back to the store. Samuel and I are picking up food and goods for the next few days. I'm not sure how often we'll be coming to town until we know for sure we are safe but Emma will probably come open the clinic as long as she shows no signs. Understandable. I'll have someone check the clinic daily then, and if two days pass where it's not opened, I'll send someone to check on you all. William would normally shake the sheriff's hand, but with no idea if he was infected or not, he kept his hand by his side and simply nodded. There were no more words needed. When he arrived back at the general store, he quickly found Samuel and helped gather the remaining items on the list. Then he grabbed several extra blankets for the boys. Though he looked for a mattress, there wasn't one in the store. Mr. Brown, the owner of the store, looked up in surprise at the amount of goods in their basket. 
Is there a get-together happening I was not informed about? Not exactly. William didn't want to alarm Mr. Brown, but it wouldn't be right to not make him aware. Doc Moore believes Jenny has scarlet fever. He has quarantined himself in the house with her, so the rest of the family is staying with me. We also need to order a mattress and some cushions for the couch. Can you do that for us? Mr. Brown swallowed audibly, and William could tell he was trying not to show his fear. You bet. I'll get that order done for you. Let's add all this up and get you on your way. With a speed William had never seen Mr. Brown display before, he totaled up the items and read off the amount to William. William handed over the money and tipped his hat as he and Samuel left the store. When they finished loading the wagon, Samuel turned to him. Is this how it will be now? Everyone rushing to get rid of us? William sighed, wishing he had a better answer for Samuel. They're just scared, Samuel. Scarlet fever is nearly impossible to treat. How do they think we feel? We were exposed to her longer than anyone. If anybody gets sick, it will probably be us. He climbed into the wagon and picked up the reins. William climbed in beside him and adjusted his hat. If only he had words to comfort Samuel, but the boy was right, and only time would tell if they got sick. Chapter 22 Emma The next morning dawned too early, and Emma rubbed her eyes as she got out of bed, not sure if she had actually slept or not. As Carrie was still sleeping, she tiptoed out of the room quietly. William sat at the dining table, but the rest of the house was still and quiet. Good morning, he said as she entered the room. His Bible was open on the table, and it was clear he had been doing his devotion. Can I join you? Emma asked. Of course. William looked up at her and smiled. You never have to ask. Emma sat in the chair and sighed. She had been up most of the night wrestling not only with Jenny being sick, but with a thought that had plagued her. While she didn't want to plant any thoughts in William's mind, she needed to discuss it with someone. What's on your mind? he asked. You look like you're struggling with something. Emma smiled slightly at how well he seemed to understand her, even though they had only known each other a few months. I was pondering last night. Do you wonder if God is trying to tell us we shouldn't marry? Why would you think that? William pushed the Bible to the side and grabbed her hands. It's just, first there was the thing with Holden, and now this? I can't get married until Jenny's better, and we have no idea when that might be. Emma, this is life. Things happen beyond our control, but that's why we put our faith in God. And while God might use signs to keep us from sinning, I can't see any reason why he would be against our marriage. Can you? Emma shook her head. No, I simply don't understand. No one else is even sick that we are aware of. So where did Jenny get scarlet fever? Is there any chance your father is wrong? I suppose it's possible. He didn't let me see her, but from what I remember, the rash is fairly distinctive. But has there ever been an outbreak here? Has he seen it up close? No, the closest one was a few towns over. And now that I think about it, scarlet fever usually starts with a sore throat and a fever. I don't remember Jenny talking about either, though Pa mentioned she had a fever. Then perhaps there's a chance your father has it wrong. Emma nodded, but her mind was a million miles away. I need to speak with Benjamin as soon as he gets up. Why? I don't remember Jenny being sick before yesterday. I need to understand exactly what she did so I can look into it more. Emma couldn't stand the idea of sitting and waiting for Benjamin to wake. To pass the time, she busied herself making coffee and breakfast. With every sound of footsteps, Emma turned excitedly, only to face disappointment when Carrie or Samuel entered. Breakfast was ready before Benjamin wandered into the kitchen, and Emma forced herself not to overwhelm Benjamin with questions before he had eaten. When the food disappeared from his plate, though, she turned her attention to him. Benjamin, can you tell me everything you and Jenny did on your way to school yesterday? 
Benjamin's head tilted to the side and his voice was quiet as he spoke. Why, do you think something we did gave her scarlet fever? I think it might not be scarlet fever at all. Did Jenny complain of a sore throat or of being too hot in the last few days? Benjamin pursed his lips and scrunched up his forehead as he tried to remember. Then he shook his head. Okay, those are two common signs of scarlet fever, so if she didn't have those, she might have something else. Carrie said she vomited and had a rash, so what did you do on the way to school? Benjamin's eyes fell to his plate as his lower lip folded in. I told her not to. I was mad she was walking so slowly, so I let her into the fields. I figured she'd just get mad and cry a little, but she didn't. When I didn't hear crying, I went to find her and she was sniffing some flowers. I told her to stop because I wasn't sure if they were good or not. Is it my fault she's sick? Emma debated her answer. On one hand, she wanted to scold Benjamin for trying to make Jenny cry. But he was probably beating himself up over it already. No, Benjamin, I don't think it's your fault she's sick. I need to talk to another doctor, but I suspect she might have touched a poisonous plant. His eyes lifted and a light of hope shone in them. Does that mean she won't die? Emma smiled and pulled the boy in for a hug. I don't know for sure, but it might not be as serious as we thought. Can you tell me what the plant looked like? Benjamin's face scrunched. Um, they were light blue or white with some blue on them? Thanks, Benjamin. That wasn't much to go on, but perhaps her father would have a book of poisonous plants at the clinic she could bring home and show to Benjamin. She turned her attention to William. Can you saddle up two horses? We may be able to telegraph and get the answer we need, but it might require us traveling to another town to speak to a doctor. As William nodded, Emma turned her attention to her sister. Carrie, can you stay with Benjamin until we get back? Of course, Carrie said. Samuel and I will hold down the fort. All right, let's go. William William knew better than to argue with Emma when she had a fire shining in her eyes. He didn't know what was in her head, having no medical knowledge himself, but he trusted that she was on to something. He followed her outside and quickly saddled up their horses. Emma led the way into town, pulling her horse to a stop in front of the railway station. Her shoulders back, she marched into the station and to the telegraph office. William followed close behind. Horace, she said in a strong voice, I need to send a telegraph to one of the neighboring doctors. Yes, ma'am. Horace removed the pencil from behind his ear and pulled out a pad of paper. What would you like it to say? What else causes a rash like scarlet fever? Horace's large brown eyes shot up, full of concern. Someone has scarlet fever? It is possible Jenny does. Emma waved her hand in dismissal. But I'm beginning to doubt it. Who's the closest doctor? Let's see. Horace tapped the pencil on the desk. There's a doctor in Lisbon. And one in Belleville, I'm fairly certain. Lisbon will be fine. It's closer. Okay. Horace looked back over the words he had written. Since you have fewer than ten words, that will be twenty-five cents. Emma reached for her pocket, but William pulled the money from his own before she could. William, you don't have to pay for this. I might be wrong. It doesn't matter if you are. He handed the money to Horace, who placed it in the till and then turned to the telegraph machine. How long does it take to get an answer? Emma's fingers drummed ever so softly on the countertop. Not long if their telegrapher is working and can reach their doctor. Horace tapped out the code to send the message. Okay, all done. Now we just wait. Great, we'll come back. We need to check my father's clinic. As Emma spun and hurried out of the store, William flashed Horace a shoulder shrug. He did not understand what she needed at her father's clinic, but there was certainly something on her mind. The horses remained tied up outside the stagecoach office, 
but William saw Emma's figure barreling toward her father's clinic. He jogged to catch up to her. Not that I mind, he said when his stride matched hers, but what are we looking for in your father's clinic? Medical journals. Emma's matter-of-fact tone matched her steps. I spent some time studying them after Joseph died. I remember something about scarlet fever in them. William blinked in confusion. I thought that's what we were telegraphing the doctor for. It is. The doctor should be able to tell me more about scarlet fever. But if I'm right and it is something else, I'll need his knowledge to convince my father. Emma pulled the key for the clinic out of her pocket and opened the door. He may not take my word on it. William followed her into the clinic and watched as she scanned the shelves. Medicines and bandages filled most of them, but one shelf held a row of books. Emma's finger trailed across each one until she landed on the one she wanted. I think this is it. Emma pulled a book from the shelf and took it to the cot. She sat down and opened the book, turning the pages and shaking her head. Yes, here it is. Emma pointed to words triumphantly a few pages later. Scarlet fever presents with a sore throat first and then a fever, but its distinguishing characteristic is a red rash like sandpaper that covers the body. I don't understand. How does that help us? Carrie said she had a rash, and your pa said she had a fever. Though he was trying hard, William could not seem to make the connection that Emma had. Yes, but she didn't say it was a rash like sandpaper. Lots of other things can cause rashes. Emma flipped through the pages again. So you suspect she sniffed a poisonous flower? The pieces finally fell into place for William. What about the vomiting and the fever? I'm not sure about that. Emma bit her lip, sending tiny crinkles across her forehead. Maybe she ate something that didn't agree with her. That could cause vomiting and a fever. It's possible the rash came from a poisonous plant, though. We know poison ivy causes a rash. What if there are other plants that do, too? William marveled at Emma. She had displayed little interest in continuing at the clinic, but now William wondered why. She seemed to have a gift. Emma set the book beside her on the cot and then returned to the bookshelf. Her fingers once again scanned the books but didn't choose one. I see nothing else helpful here. She turned to face William. Let's see if Horace has received a reply yet. William nodded and stepped aside, allowing her to exit the clinic first. Her stride back to the stagecoach office was purposeful, and William hurried to keep up with her. I just received a response, Horace said as they entered. He waved a piece of paper, and Emma's hands splayed on the counter. What does it say? she asked. Arriving tonight. That's wonderful. Emma clapped her hands and smiled. The doctor is coming here. Let's just hope he knows about poisonous plants as well. Indeed, William said. Horace, will you send the doctor to my homestead when he arrives? Yes, sir, I'll make sure of it. Let's check on Pa before we head back. William nodded and mounted his horse as Emma did. Within a few minutes, they were at Doc Moore's place. All was silent and still, but the white towel still gleamed in the window. William hoped Emma was right and Jenny was just reacting to a poison. Though there was still some danger in that, her chances of survival were much greater. Chapter 23 Emma Emma nearly bounded to the door when the knock sounded later that evening. He's here! She threw the door open, and then her smile fell and her forehead wrinkled in confusion. I'm sorry, can I help you? On the other side of the door was not a man, but a kind-looking woman with gray streaks in her hair. I'm Willie Dixon. Dr. Dixon from Lisbon, are you Emma Stewart? Emma continued to blink stupidly at her as the information sunk in. I am. So sorry. She recovered her manners and smiled at the woman. I was expecting a man. Dr. Dixon's laugh showed off the laugh lines around her eyes. 
You would be amazed how many times a day I still hear that, even though I've been Lisbon's doctor for nearly a year now. Who's this, Emma? Benjamin asked, coming up beside her. Emma turned to find William, Carrie, and Samuel behind her as well. This is Dr. Dixon. Dr. Dixon, these are my brothers, Benjamin and Samuel, my sister Carrie, and my fiancé William. Let's step back and let her in. Dr. Dixon smiled as she entered. Don't worry, I come from a large family myself. I'm used to the crowding. Emma led the way to the dining room. I wish there was more comfortable seating to offer you, but we are still finishing the house. The woman doctor sat in the proffered chair. Again, it's fine. Could I trouble you for some water, though? Carrie hurried to the basin that had been filled that morning from the well and secured a glass. She set it in front of Dr. Dixon as William and Emma sat around the table as well. Samuel leaned against the counter, and Carrie took the last chair and pulled Benjamin onto her lap. Thank you for coming, Emma said. Dr. Dixon took a long drink of water before replacing it on the table. I was delighted to. One reason I became a doctor ten years ago was that I lost one of my nephews to scarlet fever. Since then, I have been studying it to try to understand it so I can work to eradicate it. I didn't even realize women could be doctors, Benjamin said. Dr. Dixon smiled at him and said in a kind voice, Well, about 40 years ago they couldn't. But thanks to Elizabeth Blackwell, pioneer in the way, women can earn their medical degrees. Of course, it's still mainly a profession for men, so women have a hard time opening up clinics. It's why I moved out west, they typically have a greater need for doctors, so they are slightly more accepting of women doctors. It's still an uphill battle. So tell me about this patient. It's my little sister, Emma said. She attended school yesterday and left early with vomiting and a rash. My pa, who is the doctor in this town, said it was scarlet fever and quarantined himself in the house with her. But I don't remember Jenny having a sore throat or a fever before she developed the rash. When I asked Benjamin to tell me about their trip to school, he said she was sniffing flowers. I thought maybe she touched something like poison ivy or something that would cause the rash. With a narrowed gaze and a slight smile, Dr. Dixon leaned forward across the table. Do you want to become a doctor? Emma felt a heat cover her face and she dropped her gaze. I'm not sure. I helped my pa out in his clinic after my late husband Joseph died, but I hadn't planned on continuing once William and I married. However, when Jenny got sick, I felt this need to be sure that it was scarlet fever and not something else. She was like a madwoman earlier. William flashed a smile at Emma, and she ducked her head as the heat seared across her cheeks. After telegraphing you, she tore through her father's clinic until she found what she was looking for. That's how it starts, Dr. Dixon said with a knowing grin. Well, Emma, if you ever do decide to get your degree, I'll put in a good word for you at medical school, and you'd always have a place working with me at my clinic. Thank you. The thought had never occurred to Emma, but working with another woman in a clinic held an appeal she hadn't considered. I appreciate that. All right, I've sat here long enough. What do you say you take me to your pa's house and let me look at little Jenny? Emma nodded and everyone stood around the table. Dr. Dixon turned her focus to Benjamin. I'd like you to show me what she was sniffing on the way. Think you can do that? Benjamin pulled back his shoulders and puffed his chest out. Yes, ma'am, I'd be happy to. Good. The group headed outside, and Samuel quickly readied the wagon. A few minutes later, he snapped the reins and urged the horses toward the schoolhouse. Stop here, Benjamin shouted as they passed the school. It was somewhere around here. Samuel pulled the wagon to a stop, and the group clamored down. Dr. Dixon followed Benjamin, and Emma fell into place behind her. Benjamin turned left, walked a few steps, and shook his head. 
Then he turned right, walked another few steps, and yelled, Here! This is where I found her! Be careful not to touch anything, Dr. Dixon warned. Emma stopped and watched as Dr. Dixon leaned in to examine the flowers. This is a lead wart, and if your sister was sniffing it, it could definitely cause her rash. But it wouldn't cause the vomiting. You said she vomited as well, right? Emma nodded. It was the piece that still perplexed her. Dr. Dixon turned around and scanned the other plants. Then she took a few steps farther in. Benjamin she said. Is it possible Jenny ate some berries? His eyes dropped to the ground and he turned his toe in the dirt. I guess it's possible. I didn't come looking for her right away, but she should know better, right? Emma bit her lip to keep from scolding the boy. Yes, Jenny should know better, but Benjamin should never have left her alone in a field full of poisonous plants and berries either. Dr. Dixon looked to Emma. This is Jerusalem cherry. If she ate more than a few berries, this might explain her vomiting and possibly her fever. I think you might be right, Emma. I need to speak to your pa. The group quickly gathered back into the wagon and continued toward Doc Moore's homestead. As they approached, Emma noticed a plume of smoke rising from the chimney. Her heart constricted, but burning the clothes and bedsheets of someone with scarlet fever was common practice. They thought it would kill the germs and keep others from getting sick. What's Pa burning? Benjamin asked. I'm sure it's nothing. Dr. Dixon's eyes connected with Emma's. Were they wrong? Did Jenny actually have scarlet fever and succumb to it? You all stay here, Emma said when the wagon stopped. I'm going to take Dr. Dixon up and see if Pa will let her in. For once, there was no argument from Benjamin or Carrie. William jumped down and offered his hand to help Emma and Dr. Dixon out. But then he too stayed by the wagon as the women made their way up the porch. Emma sucked in her breath as she glanced at the window and saw the white towel was gone. What is it? Dr. Dixon asked. I had Pa put a white towel in the window to inform us everyone was okay. It's gone now. Dr. Dixon squeezed her arm and offered a reassuring smile. We know nothing yet. Maybe there's an explanation for it. Emma nodded and tried to calm her racing heart and surging emotions. She knocked on the door and stepped back as she waited for her Pa to answer. It swung open a moment later. Emma? Doc Moore asked. I told you not to come around. Has someone else gotten sick? No, and that's why I'm here, Pa. I'm not sure Jenny has scarlet fever. Has she gotten worse? He shook his head. No, the rash is bad, and she vomited quite a few times yesterday, but she is resting now, and her fever seems to have gotten better. Why is the towel missing from the window, then? Emma asked. Doc Moore leaned back and looked to the window. I burned it when her fever lessened. My hope was that if we burned anything either of us had touched, we would not take ill again. Dr. Moore, I'm Dr. Dixon. The elder woman put her hand forward. I've studied scarlet fever profusely. Would you mind if I look at her? She's the doctor in Lisbon, Emma answered, when her pa's questioning eyes landed on her. I telegraphed over when Benjamin told me Jenny was playing in some wildflowers on the way to school yesterday. It turns out she might have touched leadwort and possibly ingested Jerusalem cherry. Please, can I examine her? Dr. Dixon repeated. Doc Moore bit his lip as he looked from his daughter to the other woman. Then he stepped back and opened the door a little wider. You can come in, but Emma, I want you to stay outside until we are sure. Emma nodded, though every part of her wanted to be beside Dr. Dixon. She needed to see for herself that Jenny was okay, and if she wasn't, she wanted to be able to tell Jenny she loved her before it was too late. As Dr. Dixon stepped into the house and the door closed, Emma turned around and headed back to the wagon. What happened? Carrie asked. Emma sighed. She went in, 
Now we just have to wait and see. The moments ticked on, and Emma stepped into William's embrace, needing some comfort while they waited in uncertainty. William William caressed Emma's shoulder as she leaned against him. He wished he had more comfort he could give her. Lord, please let Emma be right. This family has had enough tragedy. So had he, for that matter. The cabin door opened, and Dr. Dixon stepped out. Beside him, he felt Emma stiffen and heard her suck in her breath. Her hand curled into a fist and flew to her lips as she waited. Emma, you were right. Dr. Dixon hollered and a large smile erupted on her face. She's okay. Everyone can come in now. There were shouts of joy and a few tears as the group rushed into the house. William stayed at the back, not because he wasn't happy to see Jenny, but because he could tell the family needed to be there first. I don't know how I misdiagnosed it. Doc Moore shook his head. But I'm sure glad you kept looking, Emma. Don't be so hard on yourself. Dr. Dixon laid a hand on Doc Moore's arm. It would be easy to misdiagnose. She had a rash that looked very similar, and because she ingested berries, she also had the vomiting, and she even occurred a fever as her body fought off the poison. How are you sure, then? Emma asked. There is a pattern that happens to a person's tongue when they have scarlet fever. It becomes speckled like a strawberry. Your sister doesn't have that. And after a closer look at her rash, it isn't rough like sandpaper the way it is with the fever. Dr. Dixon turned her attention back to Doc Moore. But if I hadn't studied it as much as I have, I would probably have reached the same conclusion. Better to err on the side of caution and be wrong than not and have an outbreak occur. A red rash covered poor Jenny's face and her skin was pale, but her eyes lit up when William leaned into her. He burned my doll, William. Though she tried to be brave, William could see tears welling up in her little eyes. I'm sorry, Jenny. I thought I was getting rid of the sickness. Doc Moore laid a hand on her forehead and smiled apologetically down at her. What's the treatment for her now? William asked. There isn't much left to do, Dr. Dixon replied. Dr. Moore did well with getting her enough fluids. That will wipe out the poison from her tummy. I can give her some cream, but the rash should go away in a few more days. Will she be well enough to attend church on Sunday? Wheels were turning in William's head at a possibility he thought had been extinguished. I don't see why not, Dr. Dixon said. Elation filled William's soul. If she could attend church, they could still get married on Sunday. He needed to speak to the preacher and make sure the wedding was still on. Can I borrow a horse? I need to go into town for a bit. Emma looked at him in confusion. Can't it wait? William bit back his smile. He would tell her later, but right now he had two things on his mind, and he wanted both of them to be a surprise. With Doc Moore's assent, William raced out of the house and quickly saddled one of the horses in the barn. He rode first to the mercantile. Mr. Brown regarded him with wary eyes as he entered, and William smiled as he stated, It was a false alarm, Mr. Brown. There is no scarlet fever. Relief flooded the man's face, and his eyes turned heavenward. Thank the Lord. I was so afraid for her and for myself and my customers. I'm sorry if that sounds awful. William shook his head. It's completely understandable, but I'm hoping you can help me now. Doc Moore burned Jenny's clothing and bedding, including her doll, when he thought it was the fever. Can you help me replace them and get her a new doll? It would be my pleasure. Mr. Brown led the way through the store, grabbing sheets and a new dress for Jenny. Then he stopped and rubbed his hand across his chin. Dolls are usually handmade, but let me see if I have any in the back. That my sister made. She does them for fun on occasion, and her daughter has more than she needs. William waited as Mr. Brown ducked into the back and returned with two fabric dolls. 
One was made with a blue gingham and the other just a brown muslin. He looked from one to the other, but had no idea which Jenny might like more. Would it be all right if I took both? After settling the bill, William shoved the goods in the saddlebags and headed over to the church. Pastor Lewis was in his office looking over papers and his Bible, probably preparing for his sermon on Sunday. William, Pastor Lewis said when he looked up, what can I do for you? I don't know if you had heard about Jenny Moore, but it turned out to be a false alarm, and I was wondering if you could still marry Emma and me on Sunday. Praise the Lord. Pastor Lewis rose from the desk and clapped William's shoulder. I had heard, and I've been praying nearly all day for the family. I'm so pleased to hear that Jenny is okay, and I'd be honored to marry you and Emma. Thank you, sir. The men shook hands, and then William headed back out to the waiting horse. As he rode up to Doc Moore's house, surprise filled him at the sight of Emma standing on the porch. Her hands were on her hips, and a stern expression resided on her face. William Cook, just where did you go running off to? William chuckled as he grabbed his goodies from the saddlebag. I went to get your sister a new dress, bedding, and a doll though I couldn't choose, so she ended up with two. Her face softened. You really are too good for me. Oh, I don't know about that. He circled her waist with his free arm. But I also stopped by the church. Pastor Lewis is still willing to marry us Sunday if you're ready. Emma's eyes widened. Oh, I had just assumed you would want to postpone it with everything happening. Absolutely not. I told you I wanted to marry you quickly. This just brought that idea home. None of us know how much time we have here, and I want to spend every available moment with you. Oh, William. Emotion filled the words, and her eyes glistened with tears as William leaned down and claimed her lips. This has been A Second Chance at Love, a Sage Creek Romance. Written by Lorena Hoops. Copyright 2022. Narrated by Lorena Hoops. Audio copyright 2023.